All right. Welcome, everybody, to Standing for Truth. My name is Donnie Badinsky, and I am your host and moderator for tonight's great salvation debate. I am thrilled to have Dr. Robert Sinjanis and Chris Morrison here with me to debate this important topic. The question that we are specifically engaging tonight is, is justification by faith alone? Chris Morrison takes the affirmative and Robert Sinjanis takes the negative. I have hosted both Chris and Robert many times in the past, and I always look forward to and enjoy their debates. And so it is a privilege to have them together debating each other. So I think this is going to be a debate to remember. Gentlemen, let's get acquainted, kind of break the ice a little bit before we get into opening statements. Uh, Robert, let's start with you. Been a little while since you've been here. If I remember correctly, your last time here was for your debate on the millennium, which was an excellent uh, event on eschatology. So Robert, how have you been? And also a little bit about yourself. I don't even remember doing that that debate. <laughs> I do, because I enjoyed it. <laughs> I'm a, I must be getting too old for this, I'll tell you. I think this is going to be my last debate. I'm losing I hope life. not, because you're a fan favorite. <laughs> no, really? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Try to butter me up. Huh? There we go. Okay. Um, and you, so what do you want to know now? <laughs> you want to just know a little bit about what I do? Just a little stuff? bit about what you do, okay. yeah. So, um, well, I've been in Catholic apologetics now since um, 1992. So that's 20, what, 32 years ago I've been doing this. And um, it's a labor of love. And um, I'm able to support myself and my family through it. And... Um, you know, I, well, I was a Protestant for 17 years, and so I got to know a lot about why there's a controversy. I was in and out of probably six different denominations, and um, I think I've been through every wrinkle of the controversy that's out there, and probably some more. Um, and so I know, I know how the other side thinks, let's put it that way. So I guess that's what I'm trying to say. A lot of Catholics come into debates like this and they don't have a clue what the Protestants think, how they use the Bible. Um, they just, they just don't understand it. And so you, you, you don't get many good Catholic Protestant debates on this issue, justification. You get some on Sola Scriptura. You know that issue there, but um, and then creation, you can't find that many Catholics that believe in creation anymore. It's just a dearth out there. Um, they all believe in evolution, and you know, I, as you know, believe in uh, that the that the uh, I dare to say that the sun goes around the earth, you know. <laughs> so, uh, there's even less Catholics that will you know, be in tune with that. So but, you know, I make progress and it's a, it's a day in and day out work and it's just one person at a time that you talk to and uh, try to do as best you can. And uh, 32 years of it, I, I've written 50 books. Um, I've made probably, what, half a dozen movies. I've made probably a couple, well, yeah, probably a, uh, two dozen DVDs. CDs, papers, I've written a hundred or so. Um, I've been on EWTN, which is a big Catholic network. I've been on CNN. I've been on the BBC. Um, I've traveled the world internationally doing talks and lectures and on this stuff. So, you know, I paid my dues, I think, you know, I, I <laughs> anyway. That's it. Very good. That's something we'll have to uh, get arranged in the future. Uh, a creation versus evolution debate. Oh, I love it. You're right. Yeah, that'd be fun. I would love it. The challenge is out there to you evolutionists. So, okay. <laughs> very <laughs> uh, very good, Robert. I appreciate it. For those that want to see more from you and also more of your past debates here on the Standing for Truth debate platform, do check the description box of this video for those links. Chris, great to have you back as well. Last time you were here, if I'm not mistaken, was for a fantastic uh, debate on First John, which was also mm -hmm. soteriology related. So uh, how you been since then? And also a little bit about yourself and your ministry. 
Thanks for asking. Always really good. I have not done, and Robert, it's not that you're, it's not that you're getting older, it's that you've done too many debates at this point to remember them all, and I've not done that many. I'm still paying my dues. <laughs> oh, you're so gracious. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you. I, I, I hope I hoped to, to stay that way the entire night. Um, no, really. So what I would just say, uh, quick about me, um, just if we can just say a prayer for me and my family, my wife is graduating law school. And so there's about to be a time of transition in our lives. Don't know what that looks like. So God has that in plan. So living by faith is whatever precisely that means we'll discuss tonight uh, is a big part of my life in ministry. Uh, Gulf side ministries. We do apologetics. I was telling Robert beforehand. I don't think I mentioned this to you all in the previous debates. I was by training. I'm a hospital chaplain. And Robert, I actually worked in a Catholic hospital for six years, and I did my master's thesis on Thomas Aquinas's notion of divine simplicity. So at some point, I want to talk to you about that, because I know that you you are the interesting Catholic who is, I don't think you're like a hardcore Thomist, to put it to put it mildly. Yeah. So I, I might be more Catholic than you on that regard. So that's really interesting. Probably, yeah. Yeah. I think <laughs> Thomas sometimes was an egghead. <laughs> yeah. no. So uh, anyway, but that's um, that's my background. And um, yeah, just I've been in the faith alone arena now for a long time. I'm ordained in the Christian and Missionary Alliance. And like I said, we'll just see what God has next for us. And I'm looking forward to a to a fun conversation and just uh, just seeing I, I, I'll say and I want to see an edifying where people can understand the, the views better, because I'll agree with you. A lot of people don't do these conversations well. All right. Very good. I appreciate that, Chris. For those that want to see more from Chris as well, I do have his relevant links in the description box. It's exactly why we host so many debates on so many important topics is it gets us out of our theological echo chambers, puts us into the debate octagon where we can discuss these issues in, in a professional manner. So we've gotten our uh, laughs and fun out of the way. Now it's time to bring the heat. <laughs> Chris, Robert, appreciate those. Uh, there we go. Appreciate those intros. Let me go over the format briefly for the audience, just so they know what uh, they're in for. So we're going to be having uh, opening statements. It's going to be a formal debate tonight. We're going to be having opening statements, 15 minutes each. Chris Morrison's in the affirmative. Again, the question is, is justification by faith alone? Then we're going to have a rebuttal. 10 minutes uninterrupted for each guest, followed by 50 minutes of cross-exam. Everybody's favorite parts of these debates, cross-exam, 25 minutes each. Then we'll have a closing statement of five minutes where Robert and Chris can wrap up their thoughts and points for tonight. And then this is where we get you guys in the audience involved. We'll have a roughly 25-minute audience Q&A. So please, if you do have a question, let me know who the question's for. And then do your best to tag me, either at Donnie or at Standing for Truth. That way I won't miss them. So with that, let's get right into our first opening statement. Chris, whenever you're ready, please let me know. And right. I'll start the timer on your first word. I'm going to try to share my screen, see if this works. This is the first time I did this was last time. So I just click tab to share. And then I got a, that's my big screen that you're all seeing now. Here we go. So can you make it from, can you see my screen? Are we looking right? Yep. Yep. Looks good. Excellent. All right. Well, then let's go ahead and get going. Uh, Donnie, thanks, of course, for having me back. It's always an honor to be with you. And Robert, thanks for joining me for a conversation on justification through faith alone. I know you've done these uh, many times in the past. And so I'm looking forward to, as I said, an edge, uh, a cordial and edifying conversation. We can all you know, learn a little bit. So since I am going to be defending uh, justification by faith, alone, let me start by defining the terms as I understand them. Uh, first of all, justification and Chris, I'm just going to pause your timer. Are you looking to have on my end? I just see our, the, our email exchange. Is that what you're wanting us to see? No, I want to see the actual slides. So that's <laughs> you're just in our, they you're in our showing. Gmail exchange. <laughs> let me go. I appreciate you letting me know. So let Good me go I didn't say anything. Email. I didn't want the audience to see. No, I'm just there kidding. you go. See, look, y'all all have my email. People email me. Let me know. Let me, let's see. Let me try to present again. Stop I wonder. Screening. I feel like the issue is you didn't click entire screen. You might've clicked just one. Window. Oh, that's probably exactly what happened. Entire screen. Yeah. That's what I need to Good do. Good thing I said something or else we would have been looking at your uh, email the entire time. It is. And I have a nice little PowerPoint that I put, that I did put together. 
I know some of y'all guys do this and like, you're just like really good at this. See, that's what you were supposed to see. Yeah. <laughs> you're an there expert you now. And and one yeah, last recommendation, you, you'll see where it says hide. If you click yeah. hide, then we won't have to look. Yeah. You're good to go. All right. Very good. So uh, as I was saying, then get my time right going, defining terms. When I say justification or righteousness, I take these as synonymous. That'll be important here in just a minute. Um, and so all those, you know, just, uh, just justify, declare righteous, all that. Basically, the word just means something is what it ought to be. It's in right standing, right relations. And so there are just weights, there are just measurements, and of course, there are just people. I take faith to just be simple belief or trust. I think that's lexically the only plausible definition of the word. And I think that's the way the word is defined in Hebrews 11, 1. Anyway, and then uh, I don't have to rely on this, but the whole phrase is soteriological, which is to say what we have to do to go to heaven to kind of speak popularly. So the proposition I'm defending tonight then is the claim that if you want to be rightly related with God, such that you're going to spend eternity with him when you die, then it's enough just to put your trust in Jesus to save you. Do that, you're saved. And to, to defend that, I'm going to put forward three basic arguments. I want to start with, uh, in the the spirit of the old song, Hit Me With Your Best Shot. Some of y'all will remember that. I want to look at a couple of arguments that I've heard uh, Robert use in previous debates, one based on James 2.24 and Romans 2, uh, and just try to establish the basic plausibility of the doctrine. And then after that, I want to look at a logical notion, which I've talked about in previous debates, necessary versus sufficient conditions. I think the Bible presents faith as a sufficient condition to be saved. And then finally, I want to make an a fortiori argument, a how much more than style argument. Jesus liked these. I'm actually going to argue that sanctification is by faith alone. And this is going to back into do a justification. So I'm hoping that this will produce some really interesting conversation. But let's start off the bat with looking at what I think are some good objections. And the first, I, I'm going to use the NIV because the phrase faith alone is that's what it's translated here. I think that's helpful to Robert's position. So he writes here in James 2.24 that you see a person is considered righteous or justified by what they do and not by faith alone. And then the argument is that this is the only place in the Bible that faith alone is used, the phrase, and it's used to negate the doctrine. Therefore, the doctrine is false, which would be a good argument if that's what the text actually says. Uh, unfortunately, the word alone there, I'm not going to do too much grammar, but that word alone is an adverb, and so it doesn't and indeed can't modify faith. So the phrase faith alone, as we mean it tonight, doesn't even occur here. In fact, because it's an adverb, it modifies the verb justify. And so what this actually says is that a person is considered righteous or justified not only by faith, but also by faith or by what they do, rather. So the upshot turns out to be that there are two justifications. And this turns out not to be controversial. I know Robert holds to this. I believe he does anyway. I know Bob Wilkin holds to this. This is uh, this is a pretty widely held view. But because there's two justifications, we can't say that this negates justification by faith when in fact there is a justification by faith. It's just that there's also a justification by works. And the question becomes, what are the effects of being justified by works? And then what happens if you don't obtain the justification by works. I think what Robert's going to have to argue tonight is that if you don't obtain a justification by works, then somehow your faith what isn't real or isn't sufficient, and therefore you're going to go to hell. I don't know if the text actually says that. As far as I read the text, and we'll do this more of this detail later, but what the justification by works does is it makes your, you, your faith becomes useful. It completes it. That's back in James 1 stuff, out of mature, complete faith, nothing and nothing. It fulfills the scriptures that it says when we're justified, and we get to be called a friend of God. So I think that that's all important stuff. So I don't think the James 2 passage does a lot to justification by faith alone as an objection, insofar as it just presumes there is one, but we need to talk about the justification by works. The big, next big argument is Romans 2, uh, and there's several verses here, but we see here clearly in 2, 5 through 7 and 13 that if we persist in doing good, we're going to get eternal life. It's those who obey the law who are justified. And so how do you say that, you're, that justification is by faith when it says clearly here that you have to do the work of, of the law to be justified? And I think this is really just a cliche issue of context. Uh, what and Robert knows this argument. What's going on in Romans 1 through 3 is Paul is establishing that everybody is under sin. This is not a hypothetical. This is an honest to God offer. If Robert manages to obey the law, if I do, if, if any of you do, we'll be justified. The problem is that the only person who's pulled that off is Jesus. And that's what Paul is actually doing. This is a part of his actual argument. 
And to see that, I'm just going to pull a few verses out very quickly. Uh, the Jewish people are passing judgment. And so they're condemned because they do the same things here that not doing the law 10 through 12, uh, trouble just for everybody. Uh, the Jew and the Gentile, we have both of those already. Right Again, all who sin apart from the law, their perish apart from the law, that's Gentiles, and who sin under the law be judged by the law. So again, that's Jews and Gentiles. So then you're boasting, but that's crazy because you dishonor God when you break the law. So again, the idea is that we're all sinners. And so he concludes in 3.9 that there's no advantage to being a Jew because all, uh, we've made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are under the power of sin. So we're all under sin. So then what do you do? If you try to be justified by the law, we see that your mouth is going to be silenced. It does not going to do you any good because no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. So then how could you possibly be justified? And here's the argument. Apart, uh, uh, apart from the law, a righteousness, which is justification, has been made known. And how do you get that? It's a righteousness through faith to all who believe because there's no difference this is the same group jews and gentiles all and i prefer the translation here sin and fall short of the glory of god but instead we're justified freely by his grace so this gets we'll get into romans 4 probably later on but i think the romans 1 through 3 isn't an argument against justification by faith alone because what's actually happening is we're showing the necessity of a justification by faith alone so again james 2 presumes there is a justification by faith, and Romans 2 shows the necessity of a justification by faith. Well, then why should it be then a faith alone? Let's turn now from plausibility to positive arguments. And the first argument is that the Bible says that faith is enough. That's the language we probably should use to be a little closer to Scripture. And then I have a, a syllogism here. I'm not going to walk line by line through this. You guys can pause the video later on or come back on a rewatch, but I'll go through the essence of the argument. In John 6, 47, Jesus says, whoever believes in me has everlasting life. What he is doing here in logical terms is he's making the claim that if you believe in him, if you meet that condition, if the, if, if, if the condition applies to you that you're a believer, then follows is you have everlasting life. All believers have everlasting life. It's a sufficient condition to have everlasting life. But then it's also the case that having everlasting life is sufficient to be justified. John 17, three says that to know, uh, have everlasting life is to, is to know Jesus. And we talked about uh, justification being rightly related. You can't know Jesus if you're not rightly related to him. But here we have a simple logical statement. If A then B, if B then C, if A therefore C, that's a logical form that necessarily follows. So the argument is if faith in Jesus is enough to have everlasting life and having everlasting life is enough to be justified, then it necessarily follows that faith in Jesus is enough to be justified. And the enough is where we get the sufficient condition alone. Suppose I were, let me illustrate that. Suppose I were to go to Starbucks and I don't know why I would do that because I like real coffee, but suppose I did and, and, I, and I order my wife's $27 liquid spice cake. And some of y'all will get that joke later on. Uh, she's never going to say to me that it'd be $27 alone. She'll say to me that's $27 because that's a sufficient condition. That's enough to get this dessert in a cup, right? I give her the money. She gives me the call because she doesn't say, oh, by the way, don't forget that tap dance. The point about a sufficient condition is once a sufficient condition is met, you cannot add other, addition, other conditions upon it because that's what it means. It's enough. I've done this. That's enough to bring about the result. And so then the argument, again, just becomes that if faith is a sufficient condition, then there are no other necessary conditions. That's why it's enough. So the just faith alone is what it takes to be justified. To summarize this argument, because again, again, kind of technical, is that faith in Jesus is enough to have everlasting life. Everlasting life is enough to be justified. So faith is enough to be justified. There's nothing else to add to faith. You have everlasting life. And if the logic, you're still swimming in your hind. Go back to the previous mention, Romans 3.22. We see the same thing stated directly, that righteousness is given through faith to who? All who believe. So if you're a believer, that's a sufficient condition to be righteous or justified. So it's enough. That's what we mean when we say faith alone, that that's a sufficient condition. So we've seen, again, two arguments so far. Let's look at the third and final argument, an a fortiori argument for sanctification. Uh, a fortiori is a technical, cool-sounding Latin phrase that means how much more than Jesus used this when he said um, in Matthew 7, uh, if you being evil give good, can know how to give good things, how much more your father who's perfect give good things? 
when you ask. And so I did illustrate this idea. If I did manage for some reason to like that nasty Starbucks uh, flash roasted stuff, I'm going to offend somebody out there by now. How much more will I love a freshly ground, freshly blue, brewed cup of Jamaica Blue Mountain coffee made with my with my pour over? I, I like a good cup of coffee. If I like the bad stuff, how much more will I love the good stuff? That's a how much more argument. So I think we can make one of these for justification by faith alone. We look here at Romans 3, and I just want to focus here on verses 2 and 3. Uh, Paul says, I want to learn one thing from you. So let's pay attention to the one thing. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Of course, the answer is you receive the Spirit by believing, which is faith. Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you being perfected or finished by means of the flesh? In other words, the Spirit was received by faith. It's not received by law, not received by works. Uh, and it is the Spirit that matures us or perfects us or, in theological language, sanctifies us. That progressive kind of aspect some theologians talk about in those terms. And then so the conclusion is that we're actually perfected or sanctified by faith. There are some Christians who are convinced, good Protestant Christians who are convinced that I get justified by faith. I thought this forever. But then I, but then you got to work really hard to please Jesus with your works. And in fact, what Paul's saying is that's just false. You live the same way you were justified, which is by faith. Sanctification is by faith. So here's the argument then. If we're sanctified by faith, which is the daily living of the Christian life, then how much more do I not enter into the Christian life or be justified also by faith? And I think this is an underappreciated but pretty powerful argument. Uh, just to really drive this home, uh, the fruit of the Spirit uh, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, etc. If you want those sorts of things in your life, you don't get them by law. It's the fruit of the Spirit, right? There's that sanctification, that Christian maturity bit. And if we try to have the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, etc., if we try that by the works of the law, then look above what's going to happen. That's the acts of the flesh. That's immorality and impurity and debauchery and idolatry, etc. The irony is, for those of you guys who are worried about faith alone, if you try to live by law, you're going to find yourself struggling with sin, which is also Romans 7 versus Romans 8 stuff. The only way to live a truly uh, fruitful Christian life is by actually by faith alone. And so again, off forty or justification must be by faith alone. The objection, obviously, here is that we're talking about the Mosaic law, um, not about, quote unquote, moral laws. Uh, but again, I would point you to Romans, I mean, Galatians 3.10, in our context, all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. It is written, curse who doesn't do all things, all things written in the book of the law. And I would remind you that the Ten Commandments are part of the law. So if you think that you've got to stop lying, for example, to be a sanctified, mature believer, then you're going to have a problem because that's part of the Ten Commandments. If you're trying to do it by law, you're always going to get it backwards. Instead, the just shall live by, what's it? faith. And so again, there's sanctification by faith. So let's do a quick review of the arguments. I think we have seen that justification by faith alone overcomes the arguments, so it justifies its plausibility. James 2 doesn't negate faith alone. It presumes that there's a justification by faith. Romans 2 necessitates that there is, in fact, a justification by faith. Having established its plausibility, we can say that the Bible recognizes or argues that faith in Christ is a sufficient condition. It's enough to be justified. And because it's enough, no other conditions can be necessary on pain of no longer being uh, sufficient and contradicting the Bible. And then finally, the third argument we gave was that the Bible not only considers justification, it says that sanctification, the living of the Christian life is by faith alone. And in that case, how much more then is not uh, justification, the entrance into the Christian life also by by faith alone. So let me just finish with kind of where we go from here. Again, I'm looking forward to, to hearing Robert's response to these arguments. I would just say, I want to go take you back to Genesis 15, 6. Abraham believed on the Lord. It was credited to him as righteousness. Uh, that word believed in is the where we get the word amen from. He said amen to God. So I really want to encourage you today. Say amen to God. Let's sit down the works. And if you really want to if you want to live that mature Christian life that you're striving, that you really want to live for, the way you do that is not by works. That's backwards. You do it by faith. And then this is John 15 stuff. Watch what happens when you live by faith. It's, it's amazing what Christ will do. And with that, my time's up. I will say God bless you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Chris Morrison, for that 15-minute opening statement. Allow me to remove the slides. To the audience, I see how engaged everybody is already. Uh, I'm all caught up on questions.
So it should be an excellent, informative debate. Robert, we're going to hand it over to you now. <clears throat> Whenever you're ready, please let me know. And you also have 15 minutes. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> All right, so let's start with this phrase, faith alone. And the reason for that would be it, it's always intriguing to me that a phrase that never appears in the Bible except when it's negated, faith alone, is propped up as the uh, sine non qua of the Protestant faith wherein somehow they see this faith alone all over the Bible, and yet it's never used in the context of justification, which means to me that the Holy Spirit prohibited any author of the New Testament to use that phrase, except once, where he says justification is not by faith alone. Okay? And that's even more curious when you get to contexts like Romans 4, for example, Romans 3, 4, where Paul uses the word faith and he uses the word alone. Romans 4, he uses the word alone four times, but he never couples it with the word faith. Now, if Paul is a, what we would understand, it's an excellent theologian the best we've ever had maybe because he's inspired by the Holy Spirit and he never uses the phrase faith alone to describe how we're justified. Does that not mean something? Okay. Because he could have used it very easily if he wanted to settle this controversy that the Holy Spirit knew would come, you know, 1500 years later between Martin Luther and the Catholic church. Why not just say faith alone and settle the issue? Okay. Well, it's not. It doesn't. So we have to use that as sort of a foundation for how we approach this topic, because the Bible's very clear that every word is inspired by God to the point where in Galatians 3.16, it says that um, the Genesis writer did not use the word seeds. He used the word seed referring to Christ as the seed of Abraham. Whereas if he had used the word seeds, everything would be confused. We'd get off the track, you see. So we have to be very careful with this fact that alone is never used with faith. So I'm going to try to explain why that is the case. Okay. And what I would say, first of all, is in Romans 3.28, where it says, a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. You know, believe it or not, we Catholics believe that. Okay? <laughs> because the issue revolves around two things. One is, what kind of works are you talking about? Because if... Works can fit in two categories instead of one, where I believe Chris put them, as, as if any work that you do is just not going to count for anything, and all works, therefore, are just, you know, negative, whatever adjective you want to put on them. They have no merit in themselves at all, okay? Okay. At least that's the way he made it seem. Catholics come to it from a different perspective, based on what they read in Scripture. That, yes, works on the one hand, if somebody tries to get to God by doing works and, and holding the works up in God's face and saying, see how good I've been? You know what God's going to say to him? Forget about it. Okay. If you want to come to me by your works and you want me to judge your works, there's no way I'm going to accept you. And for all the reasons that Chris had mentioned, which is compared to God, there's really nothing you can do that where God says, oh, yes, I owe you salvation. Please pardon me for ever accusing you of sin. You know, your works are so good, I have to accept you. Okay. So Catholics believe that. 
If they didn't, then they wouldn't believe scripture. Okay, so, but they also believe in another category of works, that works can merit something with God, not because he has, he owes us something, but because he is gracious and benevolent and he looks at our works as puny as they might be and says, okay, I'll accept that on the basis of the fact that you're not trying to give me these works and present them to me as if I owe you salvation for doing that. And that's where the Jews made their, their mistake. Somehow they got to the point where all this ritual that they did and anything that they did, that God somehow owed them salvation. First of all, because they were the seed of Abraham and, you know, we're Jews and so we're special and therefore we have a ticket to heaven. And all the works that we do, well, you know, God basically must give us what we deserve for those. We deserve some merit for those. And as Romans, uh, what's it, 9, verse 31 and 32 says, they tried to be justified by their works. Okay. So that's why Paul goes into Romans 4 and he uses Abraham and David as examples of what justification is all about. Okay. And in the midst of that, in Romans 4, 4, he says, if justification is by works, then it's of debt. And that's the key phrase. If you present your works to God and say to God, as if he was an employer, God, I've put in my 40 hours of work this week. Therefore, you owe me my wage. And you know what God's going to say? No way, Jack. No way. I don't owe you a thing. Okay, so don't present your works to me on a legal level where you like I'm the employer and you're the employee. And and if, if I don't pay, you're going to take me to court and sue me and all this stuff. No way. We're, we don't have that kind of relationship. Okay, what relationship I want is like the one I had with Abraham a very personal relationship that's not based on some legal contract wherein Abraham acts a certain way and I have to pay him for what he did. Romans eleven thirty five, 35, I think it is, it says, what has anybody done that God owes him anything? And it's rhetorical, of course, because nobody has done anything that, that God has to pay him. Okay. So in other words, whatever we get from God, is by his grace that is, what is that that is god does not owe us anything and gives us what we does what we um not deserve because we don't deserve anything but he's gracious enough where he accepts us for the puny men that we are and by his graciousness says okay i see you're trying very hard to please me you are feeding the poor, you're, you know, you're doing all the things that's written in scripture about what pleases me, how you conduct yourself with your family, your relatives, strangers, loving your enemies, all this stuff. Okay. I know you're not going to do it where you don't sin. I know that, but I've given you by my grace, again, a pathway to have your sins forgiven and you have a clean soul. And now you try again and you do this for the rest of your life. You see, so I've taken care of the sin part. Okay. All you need to do is repent of your sin and my graciousness will forgive you. And you can go along having your faith and works and live a good Christian life. Okay. So you see the difference here is not that we are trying to divide faith from works because they need to be connected. Uh, what we're trying to do here is saying, well, why does Paul in one passage say that works can't justify you? And then right in the previous chapter, Romans chapter 2, he says, what? How many verses are there? Seven verses. And they're pretty explicit. Saying he who does good will receive eternal life. He who does bad will receive judgment. That's pretty clear. Okay, 
Uh, and then in verse 13, he says, the, those who are justified, uh, those who do good works are, are justified. Okay. So how are you going to deal with that? Because in the next chapter, Romans chapter 3, he says works can't be used for justification. Okay. Well, evidently, you have two different views, two perspectives of work going on here. And the way that most Protestants deal with that is they say, well, Romans 2 is hypothetical. If you, if you could work, then, um, you know, God uh, and, and do it perfectly, then God will justify you. Now, we understand that, okay? But we're not going to apply it to Romans 2 because Romans 2 doesn't apply it. We will take that sort of axiom, a spiritual axiom, that you can't work your way to God, which is what I just described with the Jews, holding their works in God's face and saying, you owe me salvation. And God says, no, I don't owe you salvation. Okay? So that's one way to view works. The other way is, well, how is it then that someone who does works can be justified? Because if you're going to take Scripture at face value, that's what the verse says. Now, if someone comes along and says, well, that's hypothetical because that's never going to happen. All right. My first question would be, where else does Paul talk, talk hypothetically about soteriology? Where in the Scripture? Romans, Galatians, Ephesians, you know, Philippians. Where does he talk hypothetically? Never. Not once. So you have no backing from Scripture for this supposed hypothetical apologetic that says Romans 2, well, we can let that go because it can't be applied. Well, evidently, since there is no hypotheticals in salvation language, you can't say it's hypothetical. Paul really means what he says. And then he goes on in the context of Romans 2, uh, 17 and talks to the Jews and says, hey, you go by the commandments. Do you break the commandments? Well, you know, you do. I've pointed it out many times. And so you are basically um, shaming what God did for you. And you know who's actually doing the works? It's the Gentiles. Okay. And how can that be? Well, because if you're in the grace of God, as I said before, wherein God has forgiven your sins because of the atonement of Christ, and you go on and you do your faith, your works, everything that a Christian's supposed to do, and you stumble and fall, then what do you do? Well, you repent to God, you get up, and you start all over again the next day. Okay? That's grace, God's grace. The Jews weren't doing that in Romans 4. They were coming to God without grace and saying, God, you owe me. They were trying to make God legally obligated to pay them for what they did. So that's not grace. Grace is, is as opposed to a legal contract as anything could be. Grace is a benevolence your uh, God gives you so that now he's going to look at you in a different way because you are in his grace as opposed to being under the law, which we all come from, from Adam, okay? And the question is, how are we going to get out from being under the law? Well, we accept, we believe that, and there's the faith, we believe that what Jesus did for us on the cross gets us out from under the law, so that we are not condemned for everything we do. Now we're in the grace of God, and he looks at us with mercy, you see, and accepts our works for what they are. Now, these works aren't going to be easy because it's not easy feeding the poor, or clothing the naked, and all those things, but he accepts our attempt to do those, even though we don't do them perfectly every time. One at minute. All. Okay? So this is what we need to um, understand. The Catholics have a understanding of works on two levels. One, where they are condemnatory, if you try to stick them in God's face. The other, wherein under grace, God accepts your works, just like he accepts your faith. I mean, is your faith perfect? No. 
Well, then why would God accept it if it's not perfect? If you're going to go use perfection as the measuring stick. No, God accepts your imperfect faith, just like he accepts your imperfect work. As long as you are in God's grace, which you get from believing what Jesus did for you on the cross, you see. So that's the Catholic position. Robert, thank you very much for that 15-minute opening statement. Gentlemen, that concludes our opening statements for tonight's Great Salvation Debate. We've got a lot of excellent points on the table to rebut and also to discuss in our cross-exam. And so we're going to jump into our 10-minute uninterrupted rebuttals first. Chris, we'll hand it back to you, and I will start the timer on your first word. Again, you got 10 minutes. Go ahead. Great. Thanks again. So I really wasn't expecting a um, uh, much of a rebuttal in the opening statement because you didn't know what I was going to say. But I will say that um, a lot of the things that Robert so talked about, I, I frankly already addressed. So let me just quickly touch on, uh, we'll touch on Romans, uh, James 2, rather. He kind of touched on that, although I think he left entirely unaddressed the issue that there is a justification by faith, which is central. And he never actually showed that if you don't get the justification by works, then you're going to go to hell. And so that's a, an essential argument. He, I think, he Chris, can I interrupt for a second? Of course. Sure. Okay. Pause my timer. So, uh, I just want to say something about a debate debate format. When I give my uh, opening statements, it's not to rebut what you said. I it's started with that. Yes, sir. I understand the issue. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's why we're having rebuttal now. So I did not purposely ignore anything you said because uh, i'm not supposed to pay attention to what you said i'm just giving my position okay just want to make that clear sure so you can start his time again if you want donnie but i thought that was necessary to say no worries i've got it on 50 seconds so you're basically more or less at the beginning chris so feel free go ahead i'll start the timer now okay i'll go mine anyway as i said he's not obligated to say something i think it's probably uh worthwhile to preface those remarks. In any case, I'm looking forward to, in his comments, the James 2, um, as well as uh, the Romans 2 issue. And I'm looking forward to his remarks, again, what I said on uh, the sufficient condition issue and on the uh, off 40 your argument. Now, regarding to Robert's particular uh, comments, I'm going to go through these a little different order than he went. Uh, the first thing he wants to do is look at, uh, we're look at the James 2 argument. He repeats the negation claim. I think I already addressed that. I kind of pre-budded that, if you will, faith. Uh, and that's further doubly so because faith is a sufficient condition. So if there is a justification by faith, then that is enough. I would also point out that the general argument that uh, God never uses faith alone elsewhere is um, it's an argument from silence because just because the word alone isn't used doesn't mean that it's not. And again, if faith is a sufficient condition, then it's not necessary. It, it's implied in the logical structure of itself. Uh, we're going to go back to obligation in a minute. Uh, regarding Romans 2, again, I've already kind of pre-butted that. I kind of laid out the context of what's going on. He, Robert asks how we're going to deal with that, that being the claim that... Um, you have to have, I believe the context that you have to have works. And yet I, I laid out very clearly that what was going on is that we are establishing the necessity. What Romans chapter one, two, and three is doing, the first part of three is it's setting a standard. It is not a hypothetical. And I would deny very strongly that what's going on here is that there's a hypothetical being suggested. There's no hypothetical. This is an honest to God suggestion where if you keep the law, perfectly, then you're going to be saved. The Jews have to realize that they can't keep the law perfectly. And by the way, neither can Gentiles. So everybody is caught up under sin. And if you try to be justified in this way, which is a legitimate effort, go for it. It's just not going to work. This is not a hypothetical. Uh, and Paul does speak this kind of way elsewhere. He talks about in Romans 7 that he tries and he just, he fails. So how do we do this? It's by it's by in Romans eight. Thanks be to God. It's through it's through Jesus Christ. Um, he did lay out two perspectives. I must have missed one. Again, we got the hypothetical perspective. I already addressed. So I don't think that uh, that I don't think that that's that's a concern. Moving on to some of the argue, other arguments that he made. He made a big deal, and I appreciate this. It's the Catholic perspective that the claim is that uh, we can't try to obligate God to us. And I would have a couple of objections. Um, 
one, I'll just be honest, me, because I mentioned early on, I'm, this is my metaphysical. I, I think it's pretty absurd to even imagine that God is the kind of thing that can be obligated. Uh, I don't really think that you, the way you respond, if someone thinks I'm going to obligate God to me, you don't respond to that by saying, well, that's not the rule to be saved. You respond to that by saying, if that's the claim, you can't obligate God. What are you even thinking? That's 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 a nonsensical position. But I also would just suggest that the obligation argument, I actually don't know that there's, I'm not, a, I'm not a first century Jewish expert. I'm not aware of the claim that the Jewish people thought that God owed them salvation, certainly not in view of just keeping the law. In fact, they believed quite strongly, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? The rich young ruler comes up and says, and they were regularly condemning sinners. So I don't actually know that that, um, I've looked through Robert's book, I, 700 pages. I could have missed it. I did not see there a particular reference to, uh, I'm curious if he has any first or second century Jewish references, or frankly, I'd be okay with something in the early middle ages in the Mishnah or something like that, that you can date, you know, back date a bit. I don't, I'm just not aware of those. He talks about two categories of merit. Um, this is largely based on his assumption. I'm going to suggest this very gently. This is a circular argument. He's going to base on the assumption that the two categories of merit presumed as a contradiction in one through three and chapter four of Romans. And I just reject that contradiction. So I don't think that uh, reject that reading. So I don't think there's a contradiction. So I don't think there's any reason to have two categories of merit, at least not for salvation. Now, are there senses of that there's a category of works where they justify me in like a, um, a an, exp an, I don't want to say experience. So they justify you in the sense of, um, of rewards or relative righteousness, the kind of things you can earn rewards for. Yeah, absolutely. But just to say that um, you can be justified for doing a little bit and you can try to go to heaven so long as your heart's in the right place. Well, I don't think that works because Jesus says, be ye perfect. The standard is perfection. Hence Romans 2.13. Again, and again, James tells us that if you break even one of the commandments, that you have just broken them all. And Paul talks about our righteousness as filthy rags. So I just don't know that if I try to put forward my best efforts that they're going to get me, they're just going to get me anywhere. Um, I've already mentioned the fact, the argument that the Jewish people thought they were owed salvation. I don't know that that's, uh, I, I'd have to see some real defense of that. Uh, he touched on Romans chapter four, the argument um, from David. Um, how... I, I don't know that I'm, I'm afraid this argument proves too much because I certainly agree with him again, that we can't, we, I, I agree with Robert that we can't try to obligate God to try to save us. Uh, salvation is in fact by faith alone. But if we're going to use the David argument to say that what God is looking for is a friendship and that that friendship becomes the basis for true saving faith. Well, I have a few problems with that. Number one, how many people get so far as to have an honest-to-God friendship with him? So I think that proves too much. And I think all of us at some time fall well short of that, if not most of the time. So I don't know how you could constant, consistently say that I am I'm in a proper relationship with God. In a, I, I, I know him, seven, John 17, 3 style, to know Christ in that sense of justification. I just don't know that you can make that claim if this level of friendship is necessary. So is friendship with God possible? Well, of course, that's again what James chapter two is about. So I'm looking forward to seeing um, how that argument ends up getting played out. Uh, David was a man after God's own heart and so should we be, but he's a man after God's own heart precisely because he's a man of faith. That's what Romans four is about. Abraham was a man of faith. David was a man of faith, and because they were men of faith, they acted out on their faith, and then this acting on their faith is why they become, to use that language, um, friends with God. Uh, then he goes on to say, I, he talks about this notion of almost as if God looks at us trying our best. And I think the language uh, Robert used was God is saying, I think I can see that you're trying to please me. So I, I, I I'll cut you some slack. I'll give you some grace because you're trying to please me. But notice what that does. That renders the, the justification that comes from grace on us doing our best. Can, are we really going to say that justification is based on me doing my best? I don't know that I've ever actually done my best. And again, hence back to just uh, life is, is filthy rags, righteousness is filthy rags. And I think we have a Galatians 3 problem here. 
uh, where we already mentioned, we already saw that if you are trying to do your best, and so it's not just by faith, uh, or, or I want to learn one thing from you, he says, did you receive the spirit by faith or by works of the law? Well, having begun by the spirit, are you now, let's use Robert's language, are you trying to do your best? And I just don't think that doing your best is the basis for receiving grace. The way we receive the grace of justification is by faith alone, precisely because we're not capable of doing it on our own. And then One minute. so lastly, thank you. He wants to say that we're not under the law because of grace. And I would just say, he wants to say, we're not under the law because we, we do believe. And yet he then wants to say that Romans 2.13 is necessary, which literally talks about the doers of the law are justified. So I think there might be an intractable, to the extent that he resolves a contradiction, he might pull it right back in precisely at that point. So I'm uh, looking forward to seeing how your response to this conversation, as well as my original three and a half arguments. Thanks much. Okay, thank you very much, Chris Morrison, for that 10 minute uninterrupted rebuttal. <laughs> We are now going to hand it over to you, Robert, for 10 minutes as well. On my end, it says it's muted for you. So just make sure to unmute when you're ready. Yep, you're good to go. 10 minutes. Okay. So it's 10 minutes? Yes, 10, 10 minutes. minutes. All right. Um, okay, so let's start with the definition of faith, which was the first thing Chris talked about. And he said it's trust or belief. Um, I would go a step further and I would clarify that faith is believing in what you don't see. That's Hebrews 11 verse 1. So the reason we have to have faith is because we don't see the things that God talks about. And, you know, heaven, hell, whatever, we don't see these things. They're just words in a book as far as we're concerned. And the question is, are you going to believe what you're reading, even though you don't see it? Okay. Now, as far as Abraham's faith is concerned, um, Romans 4 goes on a long trek in Abraham's life and says, he believed even when it was impossible to believe because he was 100 years old, Sarah is 90, and God said, you're going to have a child, and Abraham believed, and God counted that as righteousness. Okay. So it wasn't just Abraham saying, yeah, God, I believe you, you know, um, period, end of story. Uh, let me go live my life the way I want to. No, no, no. This guy was called on the mat and he was made to believe in something that was impossible in that day because Sarah was barren. Number one, Abraham was old. I don't know how healthy he was, but um, to believe that. And, uh, and Paul makes a big deal about that, that Abraham believed in something that was impossible. And then Abraham goes to Genesis 22, and God says, you know that son I promised you that you waited to for 25 years, and you're now 100 years old? Well, and now he, Isaac is about 12. God says, I want you to go sacrifice him on the mountain. Okay? So Abraham has to figure out, is this God or the devil talking to me? And it's God. Why? Because Abraham had a friendship, a relationship with God for 30 years prior. And that he knew God never led him astray. And that's how I could say, yes, it's God asking me to sacrifice my son. So this wasn't just, you know, yeah, God, I believe. And, you know, end the story. This guy was put through the mill. Okay. And, so, and we're going to be put through the mill. And the question is, when we come out the other end, are we still going to have faith? OK, uh, there's a lot of Protestants out there who think, well, once I have once I believe in Jesus, I can't lose my salvation. That means I'm going to have my faith forever. Yeah. Well, good luck with that one. OK, it doesn't happen that way. There's a lot of people who lose their faith. OK, so it's not something automatic. Yeah. John, uh, uh, what, 647 was right up. If you believe you have eternal life. Yeah. Well, if you come to the end of your life and you don't believe anymore because you've had such a treacherous life, well, then you're not going to have eternal life, I guess. Is that is that what the verse means? Okay. So faith is not just something easy that you do. Like the works, they're not easy to do either. Okay. So we have to have both of them, and they're 
pretty hard. Now he um, was talking about James two. So let's talk about James two. He says um, the word alone is an adverb. Well, actually, Monos can be either an adverb or an adjective. Depends on the context. Okay, that's the word alone. The point being is that it says a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. So it doesn't doesn't matter whether alone is an adverb or an adjective. The point is being made that it's not by faith alone, and that's the only place that Scripture uses that term. Okay. So Chris is trying to make a deal. Well, it doesn't matter whether faith alone isn't used elsewhere. Well, it sure does, because your whole argument hinges on the fact that you use alone with faith. You couple it together, but the Bible doesn't do that. Okay? You have to face that fact. And I don't think you did a good job of it, actually. Um, you talk about two justifications. Well, normal Protestant theology doesn't talk about two justifications. You know, it says that there's one justification and that James 2 is just a demonstration of that justification. So I don't know where Chris is coming from on this new idea that there's two justifications here. That's Catholic. OK, because the first justification, of course, is faith. And now you have to show your works to be justified, James says. And why is James saying this? Well, in the very chapter, chapter 2, um, he says, well, when we come to the congregation, I see all the rich people taking the high seats. And when the poor man comes in, they say, here, you take this low seat over here. And what's that called? That's called discrimination. That's called hatred. That's called making yourself look better than somebody else. Oh, pride, you name it. So there are all kinds of sins going on in this church that James is writing to. And he's saying, let me tell you something. Okay, here it is. Can your faith alone save you? Faith by itself, which he says in 2.14. It's rhetorical. The answer is no. And let me give you a story to prove it. Here's this guy, Abraham, where he he, he had faith 25 or what? Um, yeah, 12 years before God asked him to take Isaac up on the mountain and sacrifice him. And what if Abraham said, no, I'm not going to do that? Would he be justified? The answer would be no. Otherwise, there wouldn't be any reason to write James chapter 2. And so what's James trying to do with these people in this church? He's trying to say, look, just because you come to church and have faith doesn't mean a thing. Because if you're going to treat this poor man like, like you are treating him, it shows you have nothing. The least of all salvation. Okay. That's the whole reason why James 2 was written. Now let's go to Romans chapter 2. Um, he says that he's not looking at a hypothetical. And it's just a point, the fact that um, no one can do the works described in Romans chapter 2. Really? Where does Romans chapter 2 say that? Nowhere. Romans chapter 2 assumes that it can be done. Otherwise, it wouldn't say that a man who works is justified. The doers of the law will be justified. If that wasn't true, then what contrast does he have to condemn the Jew for not for stealing and, and committing adultery and all the other things that he accuses him of in that chapter? It wouldn't make any sense if what he's saying is, well, yeah, we put it there, but nobody's going to do it. So, you know, it really doesn't affect uh, how we understand justification. Sure it does. Just like there is no hypothetical that Paul uses in soteriology throughout the New Testament, here he means what he says. And this is the problem with Protestant theology. They think they can twist, they like just they say, well, there's no big deal that it doesn't say faith alone. Well, and we can do the same thing with Romans too. We can just dismiss it from the conversation because it really doesn't mean anything in the nuts and bolts of justification that we have in, in Romans chapter 3. This is exactly the problem that got Luther off the track, is making Romans 2 just some kind of, you know, neutral position. And Romans 3 is the real, you know, master of theology and salvation history and, and, and theology, you see. That's where you go off the track. Um, um, <clears throat> you said, but the Jews 
um, did not obligate God. And you pointed to the rich young ruler. Well, the rich young ruler came to Jesus because he heard Jesus talking about salvation in a completely different way than the Pharisees were. The Pharisees believed that if they went through their ritual, that they were on their way to heaven. And yet they were sit sitting uh, like crazy behind the scenes. This is the kind of hypocrisy that Jesus wanted to demonstrate to the people. Don't live like the Pharisees who say long prayers and say, I believe in God and all this stuff, and yet are sinning behind the scenes. Okay, so no wonder the rich young ruler would come to Jesus and say, well, Jesus, if that's all true, how can I be saved? And what did Jesus tell him? Have faith in God? No. What did he say? Go give away all your riches and then come follow me. Jesus gave him a work to do, didn't he? Why? Because that, that's what penetrated his heart. Because the rich young ruler thought that he could keep his riches, not give to the poor, and God would accept him because he's such a moral man. 30 yeah, seconds. Give them that too, you see. I'm sorry, what'd you say? You got 30 seconds, Robert. 30 seconds. Okay. So um, let me see. How can I wrap that up? Um, yeah. So he told him to do a work is basically what the point is. Okay. Because he can have faith in God all he wants. And he said, I've done these since I was a child and all this. And Jesus says, well, you got one more thing to do. One more big work you got to do to show God that you mean what you say. Give your, give your riches to the poor. And he couldn't do it. So that verse actually defeats what you were trying to say before about it's only faith alone that's going to save somebody. And if I had more time, I'd go through the rest of it, but I don't. Gentlemen, I appreciate the fast-paced 10-minute rebuttals. And that concludes opening statements and rebuttals. We're moving into our cross-exam. And so for the cross-exam, we have a total of 50 minutes broken up into two segments of 25 minutes each. Robert just ended with his rebuttal. Therefore, Chris, we're going to give you the first 25 minutes to lead the way in cross-exam. So, gentlemen, allow me to restart the timer. And right, Donnie, I have a question. Ahead. Yeah. All right. So how do you want to handle this cross-examination? There's about a dozen different ways I've been in that to read it. So give me what you want to do. Why don't we, so I guess for the first 25 minutes, we'll have Chris lead the way just in questions, and maybe we'll try and keep both sides, whoever's answering, we'll try and keep the answers to maybe 30 seconds just to keep it free flowing and fast paced. And so from there, that, I'll just, what I'm saying is, so Chris will challenge, I will answer in 30 seconds. Does Chris have another opportunity to come back? And if yes. he does, do I? I mean, do you want to keep it flowing that way until we've exhausted the positions? Or how yeah, well, I, I think it'll be best if we do it that way, where Chris is basically uh, pushing you with questions for 25 minutes, and then the next 25 minutes, you'll be able to uh, lead the way and kind of advance questions. So, like, like Chris, if you ask a question and then Robert says something that you disagree with, maybe try to rebut it with another mm -hmm. question. Right. So you're kind of just yeah. lawyer style. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Makes sense to me. All right. Here we go, gentlemen. Let me start the timer. 25 minutes starts now. All right. Well, let's start at James 224. That seems to be the theme of the night. And that's okay with me. You made the claim, Robert, that the word alone there can be an adjective or an adverb just to establish some um, I do not. I do not want to impugn your credibility. You have a. You have a PhD. Do you, are you familiar with Greek? <laughs> yes. And forgive me. I just don't know. I'm familiar with Greek. Yeah. Okay. And what is the Greek word here behind the word alone in five twenty four? In you mean two twenty four? Thank you. Yes, two twenty four. Uh, monon. Monon, correctly. And monon would. You suggest that could be an adjective or an adverb, but Manon is parsed how? Um, here, uh, it's hard to say because, um, as I said, um, the nominative, monos, can be either an adjective or an adverb, depending on your context. Right. Manos can, but Manon with the new ending is an accusative ending, which is the adverb. Not necessarily. I don't know how you I don't know how you're saying an accusative automatically has to be an adverb. Okay. Um I will let people look accusative. at accusative. 
<laughs> but never mind. Go ahead. Okay. The point, so, the point I'm making here, uh, Chris, is that it's faith alone. It doesn't matter whether it's an adjective or an adverb because the well, point is being made that it's faith alone. It does matter. And the reason it matters is because because grammarians agree that this is an adverb and manon is the adverbial form. Um, and on can take into can can take that but an ad adjective form, but here, here it has to be a because it's an adverbial form, it can't modify pisteos, which is faith, which is a noun, and so therefore it has to say. Um, I'm, you would recognize, I'm sure, that adverb adverbs can't modify nouns, correct? Or right, yeah, unless I they're adjectival being used. But what I'm okay. saying, whether whether who's right on the whether monon is adverbial or adjectival here, the fact is, dikaya otai is then going to be the verb that is modified by monon. Correct. So and so, therefore, a man cannot not, can, is is justified. You cannot say a man is justified only by faith. It's the same idea. Which is I was trying to say, and it's rebuttal. not the same idea. So the point is, there's there there not is the in the idea. grammar here. There's the grammar here. You would agree that there you can't. You're not only justified by faith, you're justified by works as well. There are two justifications which you have cited in in the grammar as well. So given the fact that they um, let's see, continue on to my questions here. So if it's adverbial, so you you think that the phrase not only justified by faith, but also justified faith alone, that that's what I have in mind. When we say not by faith, when we say it's by faith alone, you think that not only by faith, but also by works is the same phrase. Well, Chris, look, he's trying to make a point here that Abraham is not justified by faith alone. I don't know how else you want to say it, Okay. Other than what's think, said here. I mean, what do you fine. think I think trying to say? I, I don't understand what you're trying to make it say. Well, the same thing, not so different than Bob Wilkin gave you. There are two justifications. There is a justification by faith, and there's a justification by works. You would agree there are two justifications are, are, in James 2, realize, right? Do you realize? On, it, you can ask me questions on my cross. My time is limited, okay? I'm, I'm not trying to okay. be a jerk. You can ask me. Uh, you, so you would agree with me that there are two justifications in James 2, right? Yeah, but that's not the standard Protestant interpretation. So you're bringing something new to the table here, okay? Do you recall when Wilkin discussed two justifications? Well, in Wilkin two as well? is not a leader in the Protestant, uh, you know. But uh, you're discussing with me, and you're discussing right. this as a view. So again, so you you would agree with me there are two justifications in James two, regardless of what other people think. I'm not reformed. You would agree with me there's two justifications in James two, right? Sure. Okay. So. <laughs> That a justification by works, there's a and a justification by faith. Uh, doesn't that imply that there is, in fact, a, if there are two justifications, doesn't that mean one of them is a justification by faith? There's two. So isn't that one of them a justification you mean two, by faith? Two in James chapter two? Yeah. It's implied, yeah, because okay, there you go. Because what he's saying is that he's not only justified by faith, he's justified by works. Okay, so okay. I think we've established then we agree that there are two justifications in James 2. So then the question becomes, as I suggested in my opening statement, that we need to figure out what are the implications of justification in of the justification by works. Now, you seem to think that if I'm not justified by works, by then I'm going to go to hell. Where does the text say that? What does the text actually say? If I'm not justified by works, then I'm going to go to hell. Well, there is no verse that says, you know, if I'm not justified by works, I'm going to go to hell. I mean, is that what you're looking for? A verbatim verse that says that? What's your point? I, I, my my point is that we should stick pretty close with the text. So my point is that you seem to be drawing an implication from the text. And implications can be fair so long as they're drawn from the text. But our argument is that... What's my um, implication? I'm. Do you agree? Is it your position that if I'm not justified by works, then I go to hell? It's not in the text. Are you okay, so do you, not in do you the take text. that as implication? Okay, so there's no, no verse of scripture that says exactly those words. So you're asking me that if a man is not justified by works, then he's not going to be justified. Is that correct? Are you saying, again, that if a man is not justified by works, then he is going to end up going to hell? <laughs> uh, okay, so I'm going to say, you, first you wanted me to have a scripture for it. 
Now you're saying, logically speaking, if he's not justified by works, is he going to go to hell? And I would say the per, the preponderant evidence for that would say yes. He's going. He's not going to be saved. He's not going to be justified. If you want to extend that and say he's going to go to hell, then he goes to hell. But you admit that there's a justification by faith in this passage. So the man is just. So you have people who are justified by faith, who are going to. You have believers going to hell. Um. Yeah, because they didn't do what they were supposed to have done. Now, the fact that it says Abraham believed God, okay, in verse 23, so we already know that he had faith. The question is, is he going to do the works? And if he doesn't okay. do the works, then the logical answer is then he's not going to be justified. Okay. So, again, I think it's worth – part of these debates is to get – things out on the table. And part of the okay. clear thing that you've said here is that you have people who are believers who are going to go to hell. And that's if those of us who don't believe believers go to hell, uh, John 6, 47, whoever believes in me has everlasting life. That would be a problem. No, I because James but, chapter two, verse 10 says that the devils believe and they're still so, condemned. So let's talk. Well, where's, where's salvation offered to devils? I didn't say it was offered to devils. I said, but you implied it. Just using that as a, uh, argument for those who say, well, well, the faith does save me. And James says, no, because the devil doesn't, have, but they doesn't don't. Jesus, doesn't Jesus say that whoever believes in me has everlasting life? Yeah, but we're dealing with James 2. That's the context. Okay. You can't switch okay. context because that's a whole the question of just to, no, hang on. Yeah, a question. little bit, of, a little bit of crosstalk. Let, let, let's just, I want to give it to Robert. Feel free to finish your thoughts. And then Chris will throw it right back to you for the next uh, question. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, this is what I see all the time in Protestant hermeneutic dealing with this issue. If the if the context doesn't deal with or doesn't answer their question like they wanted to, then we'll switch to something else. Well, it says over here in Romans or John or whatever, but that's a totally different context. You want to talk about John 6, 47? We'll go to that context and talk about it. I'm talking about what the questions you raised here in James chapter 2. You said a, somebody can believe and go to hell. Well, James just proved that point. The devils are already in hell, but yet they still believe. And when I said is, when I talked about if anybody can believe and go to hell, I would think that it's obvious that the reference there is to human beings. Doesn't matter. That's the question well, I have. Well, so why does James? Okay. Agree so in again, the I think that's the difference between the two of us, and it's pretty clear. So let's well, talk a little more then. James. James brought in the devils. I didn't do that. So he let's. Did. Let's look a little more about Abraham, specifically in Genesis 22. He is justified by works in Genesis 22. So let's look at what happens when we are justified by works. What specifically does James say happens in this text when we are justified? In the actual text, since we're going to stay in the text, what does James say happens when we're justified by works? Um, well, the whole chapter is dealing with, like verse 13, for example, it says, for he shall have judgment without mercy that hath showed no mercy, and mercy rejoices against judgment. So in other words, it's a context, a soteriological context. If God's going to judge you without mercy, look out. You are going to go to hell. Okay? So that's the context James sets up, is whether you're going to be saved or not. And then verse 14, he says, can that faith save him? Again, you have a soteriological context. And then he goes into the example of Abraham. Let me tell you how you're saved. Look at Abraham. He did his works. And he was saved so, for doing the Again, work. but specifically with reference to Abraham, we've been focused on Abraham. What happens to Abraham when his when his faith when he is so justified? Doesn't the text say that his faith is perfected by his works and he's called a friend of God? Isn't that the language used? Okay, so what? I just Confirming that what the text actually says happens when you're justified by works is what? So you're saying he's not saved by doing his works? I'm. We can come back to the 2.14 in a minute. We're done with the Abraham bit first. Of course yeah, he's saved. The question is what I mean. So is, he a, is, is his faith perfected and is he justified by works? Yes, he is. is That's his, what the text okay. says. Is, and, so his faith is perfect and he's, and he's a friend of God, right? Yeah, that's right. And is this the first time in the book of James that we've talked about the perfecting of our faith? No. Right. So where does it talk about perfecting of our faith earlier? Do you know? I, off the top of your head? I think chapter one does. 
Mm -hmm. right. And chapter one two. four. Right. So one four says what? You can read it. it says that if a man lacks anything, he can ask of God. Well, it's right before that. It says, yeah. uh, well, let well, patience well, have her just... perfect work that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. But you, right. you don't, you, this is again perfect a and complete. It's, okay. So, again, audience can decide if chapter one is a different context than chapter two. So, again, what we have here is that we have to perfect our works. Now, let's, let's clarify, let's clarify that context just a little bit more. Um, would you agree? I'm sure you would. This is pretty obvious that the Abraham story in James 3. And James, I'm sorry, James 2 is reflecting the story in Genesis 22, right? Right. That's the story we're getting it from. And if you go to 22, 1, if you go to James 22, verse 1, I'm sorry, Genesis 22, verse 1, uh, do you know off the top of your head? And if not, I can just tell you, I'm pulling it up myself. Genesis 22, verse 1. Now it came to pass after the thing that Abraham was tested by God. That word tested in the Septuagint. Do you know what that word is? No, go ahead. Tell me. It's it's would it, would you surprise you if it's the same word as we saw in chapter one that you just said was a different context about being tested by trials and faith? I'll accept that. Where does it take okay. you? Okay. Well, we're establishing common contexts here. Make sure I'm in the right place. Yep. So do you hold the view? That so again, this whole story is Abraham's being tested by his faith. So we get down to the end where God says, Now I know that you fear God. As an aside, not really an aside, do you do you hold the view that God is not omniscient and so that he learns new information? No. No. Okay, good. So um, if he doesn't learn new information, then when God says, Now I know that you fear God, he can't be saying he learned something new about God, right? Uh, he well, can't learn something new about Abraham, that's, right? That's a little uh, I think you're you're giving only two options. The third option there is that even God needs a witness to what he does. In other words, but it says now I know. Yeah. It doesn't just say now I know. And that's, that's language that is confirming that God has his material witness that Abraham has passed the test. Like it's not all in the mind of God, so to speak. We have witness to that here because mm -hmm. Abraham displayed it very clearly. Mm -hmm. So I like the idea of displaying. That's very much in line of thought. The question I'm 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 trying to drive at. Have you happened to look at any medieval Jewish content comments commentaries on the subject? Um, occasionally. Why? The reason I ask is because you objected pretty strenuously to Wilkins' idea of justification as a, a human oriented oriented affair i want to i just want to read you because i'm sure it's not memorized and the audience certainly hasn't this is from a 12th century that goes back at least 200 years before this is from jewish thinking okay and it says talking about now i know for a fact uh, it says that didn't god already know actually the meaning is now i am able to make my knowledge public to all because you have i have reckoned you've demonstrated this now we have a similar formulation in exodus 32 12 where god says to moses i have made your name well known the appropriate translation would be i have made you so famous that no one could dispute it so um have you looked at the connections then between exodus 33 and genesis 22 those linguistic connections uh, uh, Chris, lead me where you want me to go. Okay. I mean, you can just tell me, tell me what your point is so I can well, either, you give my yay I'm, or I'm, not. My, well, that's fine. I'm asking you questions. My job is to elicit our answers. So where I want to find out is uh, again, in Genesis 22, the Genesis 22, God says, now I know you fear God, Samuel. I'm sorry. My son is here, buddy. I'm, I'm, I'm working right now. <laughs> Kids are wonderful. Buddy, I need you to go. I'm working right now. Sorry, everybody. Daniel, y'all, I really apologize. My five-year-old just got home. Daniel, You're being I want really need you to go right He wants now. to be famous. <laughs> no, go right now. I'm not playing anymore. Go into your Robert, I'm sorry. It's not fair. It's a two-on-one now. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I'm getting near the end of the line of questioning on Exodus 3, on Genesis 32. I just want to finish up real quick. Genesis 22. 
God says, behold, uh, now I know you fear God. In Exodus 32, we see, so in Exodus 30 through 12, the language is similar. Um, so in 33, 12, what God says to Moses is now I know you by name, Robert, what does it mean to you that God knows Moses by name? Well, the next chapter in Exodus 33, it's, uh, uh when the Shekinah glory cloud comes down and visits with, uh, Moses, it says, and God talked to Moses face to face as a man talks to a man. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they had a very close relationship. That's the very reason why God could have, why right. Moses could appease God in Exodus right. 32. And God changes his mind about destroying the Israelites. He can and only do that if he had a good relationship with God. Right. And that happens because the Shekinah glory will let rest on him. Moses, his faith shines and everybody knows about Moses, his relationship with God. Right. Right. So if the, the view that I'm getting at, and, and you don't have to agree, I'm asking if you do, the view that we're getting at is that what God is doing in Exodus 33, and by extension, therefore, in Genesis 22, and therefore, by extension, this is all in James's mind, in James 2, is that what God is doing is he's establishing the names. That's the notion of justification, that he knows that knowing them is equivalent to making them known to us. So how did God go about making Moses? So this is the question. How, Robert, did God go about making Moses and Abraham so famous that we know him and are talking about him right now? Because Hebrews 11 covers the story of all that they did, the great faith, their great works, uh, you know, every everything about them made them famous. But we knew this long before Hebrews 11 was written, right? Do what long before Hebrews 11? Moses was famous and Abraham was famous long before long before. Um, long before Hebrews 11 was written, right? I hope so. So didn't God use Abraham's works to vindicate, to justify him before everybody? Isn't by making him famous? Isn't that very oh, close okay. to Wilkins' so, idea of justification before men? All right. So then what you would do then is in verse 24, you would say, man is vindicated by works, not by faith alone. Nope. That's not the word, and that's on purpose not the word. I asked you, well, I you asked you, doesn't this sound, no, doesn't this sound, it's, it's the idea, doesn't this sound, this idea of God making Moses famous, he's putting his faith on display for all the world to see, that so we can see Abraham for the righteous man, doesn't that sound a lot like Wilkins' idea of justification before men? No, because ancient no Hebrews had a thousand no. years ago. Let me answer the question. The answer is no, because when when Abraham took Isaac up to the mountain, there were no men there watching it. It was all for God. And yet, doesn't he say, now I know you fear God, that that knowing language is being we're talking about it right now. That's I think that's the piece that you're missing, Robert, well, is that we're talking think, about it right now. On. Later on, men would know about it. Yes. So I agree with that part of it. You're you're telling me okay. that when God says, I know it, well, that's all for men. No, it's for God. Because God needs evidence that Mo that Abraham did this act. Otherwise, it's all in God's head and 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 not displayed. So it's displayed for God mm -hmm. and for men. That's why God says, Now I know you fear me. There's no man who sure. have, have fear. Okay. All right, so I think uh, in my last, Sonia, I've got five minutes on my timer. Is that right? Because we had some You've got exactly five minutes, yeah. All right, so I'm pretty happy with, uh, again, I just want to, I'll come back in my closing statement and wrap that up. I think that actually, I don't really think the disagreement is, is that severe. I think you've, I think we're on the, the, the same page. And I think that justifies the, the faith alone claim and, and, and the, the, the view that free grace people tend to take on, on um, James 2. Uh, let's spend our last couple of minutes over here in Romans 4. Uh, is that right? Yeah. So would you agree with the idea that Paul is objecting to certain kinds of works? I think this is your position. It just works to try to obligate us to God. Is that right? Well, I, yeah, that's the easy way to say it. But what I'm really saying is the Jewish mentality uh, you know, the Pharisaical, typical Pharisee saying, you know, I do all these rituals and God owes me salvation, you know, or because I'm a child of Abraham, he owes me salvation. My point is God owes no one anything. We're all, we all right. start at the same level. Do you have, and again, I'm just, I just, 
maybe you do. Do you have first century Jewish documentation that this was the Jewish view, or is that something that you just kind of are assuming? I have the scripture, and it's pretty clear okay. that it, like Romans 9, verse 31 and 32, it can't be any clearer so, than that. Just that to be clear, then, what justified. you're doing is you're inter I just want to clarify you're interpreting scripture based on your interpretation of scripture, you're reading a historical situation back into Romans. And then using that to interpret Romans. That's no, what I'm hearing. No, I'm not. I'm not doing so that. So then what's your first yeah. century, what's your first or second or third century Jewish text? I don't to have to have it. All I have to have okay. is scripture. Okay. okay. Uh, which scripture, you've interpreted. If, if scripture says the Jews thought they were going to be justified by works, that's all I need. And especially and you, when you're dealing with Galatians 3, which I'm going to ask you about in my rebuttal. Looking forward to that. Story. Yeah. Do you think that... um? That uh, do you think that God is the kind? I know we have different metaphysics. Do you think that God is the kind of thing that can, in principle, be obligated to a human being? No, that's exactly what mm -hmm. I'm not saying. Okay, and so if someone, if I were to come to you and say, Robert, I'm really worried about a married bachelor, what would you say? I'm sorry. If I were to come to you, I'm really worried about a married bachelor. I'm really worried about. I might draw a square triangle. <laughs> what, what would you say? And said, so, yeah, you you got you you need to have some good uh, logistical and logical learning. And yeah, exactly. So you would appeal to my logical error, right? You wouldn't take my objection seriously. You would appeal to my logical right. error. Is that right? Of course, yeah. Yeah, and so it's so yeah. But why? What you're not doing, Chris, I can shorten this up for you. What you're not doing is saying, yeah, God can say, I owe nothing to anyone. But man looks at God and says, I think you owe me something. Okay, mm -hmm. so who's wrong? Well, the man's wrong, but, of course. Sorry, so Paul's response is to take it seriously. I think we've established our principle that if something is self-contradictory, then the, the way you handle that is just to point out the nonsense. But what it seems to me is that you're suggesting that Paul is reifying the self-contradictory drivel. How is that not the case? Reifying, he's saying what you are thinking, you Pharisees, that God owes you something is wrong. Let me tell you the real way. And then he goes on and talks about okay. Abraham and David. So rather than just pointing out that what, what God is, he he's he's he is validating their their basic metaphysical assumptions that God might be this to try to see, but that's not actually the case. That's kind well, of the position. Well, that's the taking. whole problem, is they don't know who God is. That's why they're thinking the way they are about God. Like he's some kind of employer. That's why Paul goes into the whole debt paradigm. And why bring in an employer and employee if that's not the way the Jews are thinking? And, and again, I notice, and we're running out of time. I only have like thirty seconds left. I, I just, I just want to say that I, I don't see in a te in the text where Paul distinguishes. Perhaps you can spend the last thirty seconds saying I don't see where Paul distinguishes between the kinds of works that are obligated versus just says that the concern seems to be if you work that's creating a wage. I don't, where do you see the distinction between kinds of works as if some are meritorious and in, in Romans four, I don't, where do you see that? Well, because it's, you have to I'm out of time. the whole context. That's Romans two, three mm -hmm. and four. You just can't separate Romans four from the whole context and then make your conclusion. It's exactly what I was saying that you guys do. Gentlemen, Great job. 25 minutes flew by. Let's shift now right into our next 25 minutes where, Robert, this time you get to lead the way in uh, questions and cross-exam. Go ahead, gentlemen. Okay. Um, in the story of David in Romans mm -hmm. 4, um, David says, blessed is the man who, um, uh, not saved by works, but by the grace of God, more or less. And he goes on about, you know, the godless man and all that kind of stuff. Who is he talking about there? Uh, so Paul, in you raise David, you, are you talking in 4, 6? Yeah, 4, four uh, verses 5 to 8. Who is the he man is, blessed and who is the man who... Um, so there's there's two answers that are the same with the truth. There's the, the David is a, is the specific example. And this is because this is based on, I think, Psalm 32, 
This is David is the specific example of the general case of a person who is justified uh, by faith, not according to their works. Okay. And so David experienced some of this. All right. Um, yeah, so it is Psalm 32 and Psalm 51 as well. Um, so prior to his uh, confession of sin with Bathsheba and his murdering of her husband, Uriah the Hittite, um, was David a man of God? Yes. Okay. Um, now, so this man of God fell into sin mm -hmm. with Bathsheba and murdering Uriah. Correct. And then he writes Psalm 32, Psalm 51, and confesses mm -hmm. his sin and praises the God who forgives him and so and so. Now, mm -hmm. um, in Catholic theology, that's an exact paradigm of what happens when someone who is a baptized Christian then commits a mortal, what we call a mortal sin. That's a sin that will condemn you to hell. And he goes into the confessional. He asks God for forgiveness. The priest forgives him. He comes out and he's clean. He's justified again. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, how do you view that? That a justified man needed forgiveness from his sins. And he sought it and he received it. Okay. So what would have happened if he did not um, seek repentance and was forgiven of his sin? That is David. Uh Calls for speculation. I can only guess uh, there would have been a level of divine discipline in his life. He maybe could have uh, could have died early. God could have judged in any number of ways. Uh, God seems to be pretty interesting the way that God God, God comes up with pretty uh, well. For example, the, the child that was born uh, or to, to David and Bathsheba died. Right? I might not have expected that, so I don't know what precisely would have happened. But this man, after God's own heart, Hebrews says that. Judgment begins in the house of God, that God chastises believers. And so I would expect that the chastisement would have been pretty serious. And apparently he was under some sort of chastisement already. If you read Psalm 32, it's pretty emotionally intense that he is he's suffering pretty greatly already. Um, I think some right, of that I'm maybe just his guilt and some of that is to yeah. interrupt you, Chris, because I, I'm trying to make a point and you're you're going sure. it right. So um this man committed adultery on his mm -hmm. wife and murder against her mm -hmm. husband. Okay. Aren't they sins that will send someone to hell if they do not repent? And the reason I ask that is because I said, what happens to him if he doesn't repent of his sin and is forgiven? And you said, well, he could be disciplined. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, I agree he was disciplined, but that's after he repented and was forgiven. He was still disciplined and lost his child. I'm saying to you, what would happen to him if he didn't repent of his murder mm -hmm. and adultery? Given the fact that he's a justified man, he would undergo severe discipline up to being killed and taken taken home early. But no, if you're but, asking but specifically if he, he would... Was, after he repented, He's mm -hmm. justified now. He's using David as an example of how someone attains justification, which means necessarily that when he committed the sins of murder and adultery, that he lost his justification. If not, then how is he getting it back here, according to Paul? The text in Romans never says Paul, that never says David lost his justification. Oh, so he's getting another justification somehow? No. Nope. Why does, it never, why says, does he, Paul it never says he got another one? That's something you're adding to the text. It doesn't say that. Well, then you explain it to me then. How is, okay. why is Paul talking about giving David justification if you say, well, we already had justification? Well, he's not talking about giving David justification. As I said, this is David is the specific example of the general case of people who are justified by, by their faith apart from their oh, works. So, so if you want me to walk through the text, I'm more than happy to. What you're trying to tell me is, that it's not talking about David's sin. It's talking about everybody else's sin after David. No, seven verses six through eight are, and specifically seven and eight are about David's sin because this is the blessedness of the man who has been imputed with righteousness apart from works. Forgiveness is that blessedness. Yeah, I know that. Okay. Well, then we're on the same page. We're agree. No, we don't agree. 
because you said he was justified and a justified man can't lose his justification. And yet Paul here is talking about David getting justification. And then you come back and say, well, no, he's just an example. It's the other people that are going to get justification, not David. Mm -hmm. So you're separating David from everybody else who reads this passage. No, I'm saying the text that I'm saying you are asserting that David gets justification in Romans 4. And I'm saying that Paul doesn't say that David gets justification in Romans 4. That's not what the text says. You can look at it in detail. That's not well, why use David as an example. The very person who sinned, mm-hmm. why would Paul use his M as an example? He committed murder and adultery. If he's not getting his justification back, why mention him? Because David was at this point an extremely ungodly man. And so he couldn't have gotten things from his works because his works were the kind of works that, as you have pointed out, would send a person to hell if you were trying to be judged on the basis of your works. That goes back to the argument in chapter two that no one, not even David, is a is a doer of the law. Yeah, I already know that. Okay. We're dealing okay. with so that's why he uses it here. Man. And you think you just said it. You said it. he's an ungodly man, but he can still be justified. He's still justified God and ungodly. the ungodly at the same time. See, this mm-hmm. is exactly the problem is you think because you can't lose your justification, you can live an ungodly life. Just like Luther said, I can commit a million sins. It doesn't make any difference as long as I believe in God. And I'm just telling okay. you, that's just bull. OK, all right, let's move on. All right, so well, Galatians. I appreciate. Well, let, let me. I appreciate that you think that that's bull. The question is what the Bible says, not what Robert C. Jenna says. And yeah, what Chris well, Morrison the says. The question is what the Bible says. Yeah, I know that. Okay, we're arguing the about the Bible says Jesus that we. Says. The Bible says we're right. justif- The Bible says that God justifies the ungodly by our faith. Abraham, yeah, David had right. faith as Abraham right. had faith, and therefore he's justified. Okay, that's right. That's I believe that exactly because I read the same words. And I'm applying it to David, and you don't want me to because that's going to put you in a corner. Because I'm just I'm reading the text. If if it says it, you can just point out the text. Hey, hold on a second. Sure. It's going to put you in a corner because you don't want to say that David gets re-justified. You want to say he's justified, even though he commits adultery and murder, and so he doesn't get his justification back here even though Paul's using his, him as, a, as an example of someone that gets justified. You just twist the text. That's what you do. So it's not a matter of reading Scripture. It's a matter of who's going to take Scripture at face value here. As I said, if David is not the one, then who is it? Why mention David? He mentioned Abraham in the first verses. Are you going to tell me that Abraham's just an example uh, of whatever? And, and it's, it's, he's not really giving us a demonstration of faith here, but it applies to us who have to give a demonstration of faith. No, you're not going to do that. Abraham is an example of faith that we follow. That's why he's called the father of faith in verse 12, because we follow his example. But yet when David's used as an example of the ungodly man who lost his justification, all of a sudden you say, oh, well, that doesn't apply to David. All right, so, so let's go. Well, can can right. I respond? Because that was a one heck of a speech. Uh, well, it's not a speech. It's a clarification of where we are in this debate. Okay. I need to go on. We'll talk about it later if you want. In Galatians 3, you say, um, you know, you live by the Spirit, Paul says, and and now you, you go to works and all this stuff, and you just totally devoid of the context. The context of that is the Judaizers have come in, and by the way, I know that by Jewish history, and they start telling the Galatians that in order to be justified, you not only have to believe in Jesus, but you have to do the Mosaic law, okay? And you have to do all the rituals, all the food rituals, everything you have to do. And Paul says, no, okay? That's the works of the law that aren't going to save you. The Mosaic Mm -hmm. law, the very whole context of the New Testament is the Mosaic law is now being replaced by the new covenant in Christ, where we don't we aren't going to go to the rituals and all that in order to be saved. Okay, Mm -hmm. now you made it sound like any work that the that the uh, Galatians were doing was anathema. And that's not the context. The context is talking about works of the law. 
you have works of the law. Um, um, ergon nomu is, is the Greek phrase. So that's different. That's talking about their Jewish Judaizing that was going on there. So, um, no, you distorted that passage. You got to be answers for that. Do we want to? I'm, I'm, I'm going to. Maybe we should stop. I'm not sure if there was a specific question in there, Robert, but maybe, Chris, you want to just rebut any of the points made and then we'll, we'll keep going that way. How much time? Yeah, do sure. We have, Chris? Uh, I mean, good question. We just hit the 11 minute and 35 second mark. So you okay. got about. What are you asking him to do? Minutes. What's this? What are you since, asking? Uh, since it's your cross exam, Robert, leading the way, you made a few points there, and I thought maybe to be fair, Chris, take yeah, some time. To rebut it if Chris, like. What do you make of that? Uh, well, first, I don't know where you get the idea that I said that any works that they do are anathema. That's not what I you said. Me, you want me to tell what you? I, you want me to tell you? Okay. Yeah. You use that. Use Galatians three as an example of doing your best. Well, God, I did my best. I hope you accept my work. So that applies to any work. It's mm -hmm. not talking about the Mosaic law in your statement. If they're done as works attempting, that's just what the text says. Uh, that's what, what verse that? three says. Having begun by the spirit, are you being made perfect by the flesh? Flesh is, is uh, do you receive the spirit by the works of the law? So doing, I'm doing my best to keep the law. And so I'm doing my very best. And his point is that's being perfected by the flesh, which is what makes you anathema. This doesn't mean, Robert, that if I do works, uh, James 2 style, in accordance with faith or Hebrews 11 style, that that's anathema. The question is, what is the basis of your perfection? Uh, the fruit of the spirit in uh, Galatians chapter 5. Uh, loving, joyful, peaceful, patient, kind. That's all stuff that, that's fruit, that's stuff that comes out of you. And if that stuff is done through the spirit, if this comes from faith, well, then that's real stuff. But to try yeah, to do it as, yeah, as works, that's, 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 the, that's the problem. You're distorting that also. Because in that chapter, he's talking about the sins that they committed. He says, do you not know that no one will, uh, will uh, get into the kingdom of God who does this, that, this, that, and the other thing? And he lists 19 sins there. Mm -hmm. And he says, what I'd rather you do instead of doing all this other stuff is go by the fruit of the spirit. And then he lists what the fruit of the spirit are. So it's mm -hmm. in a context of them doing evil works, whereas they should be doing good works. That's what he tells them to do by the fruit of the spirit. Okay. So there's no context here where normal good works are being shunned by Paul. What's being shunned that you didn't bring out was the rituals from the Mosaic law that they were doing, thinking that that's going to justify them. I did bring those out. That's in 310. I, I did bring those out. That's in 310. But you're not making the distinction between moral works that are told to, the people are told to do in Galatians as opposed to the Judaizers coming with the works of the law. Have, okay. I'll ask you the question. Have you ever read Jewish history about yes. the Judaizers? Mm -hmm. Well, that's how, that's one reason why we know this was happening, because we know the history of the Judaizers back then in the first century. Okay. By Josephus, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what I'm, what I'm pointing out here is you didn't make the proper distinctions. Okay. You tried to lump everything up into works. Well, we can't do works because we have to have faith alone. Okay. And that's the wrong way to do it. That's not going to, that's not going to convince anybody of anything. Um, how much time do I have? You have exactly 10 minutes, Robert. I have 10 minutes. Wow. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, um, let me go, um, um, to, um, John six forty seven. You said, um, he who believes you quoted the verses that he who believes has eternal life. Um, Tell me in just 25 words or less what that means to you. It says that if you put your if you put your trust in Jesus Christ, and specifically in the context of the Gospel of John, that's believing that he's the Christ, the Son of God, where Christ means the one who saves you. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, then you have, present tense right now, eternal life. Okay. Do you believe you can lose that salvation, that presence with Jesus, 
uh, if you stop believing. No, but I no, I don't believe that. I think that once eternal life is had, that's a standard free grace theology. Once you have eternal life, you have eternal life. Okay, so you believe that someone can stop believing and still have eternal life. Yes, that's what makes it everlasting. Oh, okay. So if I were to pose to you that um, I agree with you in the reading, he who believes has eternal life, and I mm -hmm. were to give you the corollary to that, which means he who doesn't believe does not have eternal life. What would you mm -hmm. say to that? To the extent that we're talking about people who have never believed, then they don't have everlasting life. Oh, okay. Does Do you know anywhere where it says that in Scripture, where people who never believed and don't believe when they're judged are the only ones who are going to be judged, and the ones that did believe and were saved by that and then lost their belief still going to be saved? Is there any verse of Scripture you can give me that, that proves that point? Yeah, about a hundred. All the ones that use Tell the phrase what. everlasting. Yeah, sure. John 6, 47. Whoever believes in me has everlasting life. If I if I lose my everlasting life after 10 minutes or 10 seconds or 10 years, I didn't have everlasting life. I had 10 minute, 10 second, 10 year life. Or if you want something more explicit, we can talk about in 524. He has believed he has has passed out of death, has passed into these are these are these are perfect tenses. John chapter 11 says one who believes in me will never die. Never, 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 never die. So if I have believed in Jesus and I have, then it's guaranteed I'm never going to die. If I die in the future, then that means that um, Jesus lied. Uh, First Timothy, it talks about that if I'm faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Uh, Luke chapter 8. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hold on. You a asked second. me for a few. I'm giving yeah, you a few. You gave me four of them, okay? okay. And let me, let me rebut that because it's my turn to, re to uh, cross examine you. Okay. Yes, so you, you probably know what I'm going to do to you. And um, we're so going to have a go. great conversation. <laughs> we certainly are. It says there, to 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2, verse mm -hmm. 11. Here is a trustworthy saying. If we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we disown him, he will mm -hmm. also disown us. Okay, mm -hmm. you didn't read that part. No, I just grew up, read the one that's immediately relevant, but you can read the next part also. Wait, they're all relevant. Come on. Sure. I, I certainly believe that if we deny Christ, he's going to deny us. That's completely oh, true. Oh, well, come on now. What's the difference between believing that you have eternal life and, and then not believing and still having salvation and disowning him? What's the difference between well, not believing and disowning? Rewards. Look at look, look at that parallel. If we endure, what does it say? We will reign. If we deny, we will be denied. So the parallel is enduring versus denying, reigning versus being denied. This is a rewards passage. And that's confirmed, dear audience and Robert, by if you go back to the first part of the uh, verses one down through five, he gives you three examples. He talks about a soldier he talks about an athlete, and he talks about a farmer. In all these cases, they they endure, they do what they're called to do, and they get a reward. And if they don't, they're called to do, they're not going to get the reward relevant to a soldier, an athlete, or a farmer. So that's the that's the word picture that we're that we're picking up. So again, no, if we not. died, we're, we're going to live. If we endure, we're going to reign. If we don't endure, we're not going to reign. And if we're faithless, he's faithful, but he can't deny himself. He made a promise. He's not going to break his promise. Robert, he's not going to break his promise to you. I promise you. Jesus won't break his promise to you. You know, it goes on in um, verse uh, uh, 16 and 7. He said, avoid godless chatter because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Their teaching will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus who have wandered away from the truth, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, so what are you saying? That Hymenaeus and Philetus will still be up there receiving a reward or maybe not receive a reward because they've been bad little boys on earth? Is that what you're oh, telling me? Setting aside the uncharitable interpretation, I said this the other day, comedians make a profession out of saying things in the silliest possible way. And that's a really good way to get a laugh. It's not a great way to assess truth. But look, I'm yes, if these laugh. people are saying, if these people, they've wandered away from the truth, then you have to take it. I mean, I'm not their cell. I'm not their judge. 
assuming that they believe the gospel, and it looks like that they did, but I'm not, I can't guarantee that, but assume they believe the gospel, they've strayed concerning the truth. So if I take that to believe they believed, and notice saying the resurrection already passed, this is a side commercial for I'm not a preterist, and we can't be. They overthrow the faith of some. They overthrow the faith of some. So yeah, they're they're not going to reign. They're not going. They didn't endure. They're not going to reign. But Jesus Wait is going to be minute. faithful. What's reigning? To save them. What does reigning mean? So that's that's uh, Matthew kind of language about that's kingdom rewards kind of stuff. Um, it's, well, it's wait a minute. It is, is it rewards or is it salvation or is it both? Rewards. It's rewards. Okay, so they're it's, saved, but they might not. And excuse me for my uh, attempt at com comedy, uh, com comic uh, demonstration here. Okay, that's okay. If it's sensitive to you, I won't use it anymore. It, it, I promise it's not offensive. I just was. I, I thought it might disarm it because it's it's a really good debate tactic, Robert. You're you're good at this. Okay, whatever. Um, what my point is the same. Hymenaeus and Philetus have left the faith, but you say mm -hmm. they're still going to get a reward. Mm -hmm. is that no, correct? no, not get a reward. No, no, that's the point. They're not getting a reward. They'll be saved, but they're not going to get a reward. Oh, okay. So they can depart from the faith mm -hmm. and still go to heaven. They yes. just don't receive a reward. Is that what I'm supposed to understand? Correct. Wow. Wow. Okay, I'll I'll leave it at that. How much time do I have? You have exactly two minutes and twenty seconds. Two minutes twenty seconds. Okay. Um, there's if I missed any point here. Um, 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 um. um no, not something that I could cover in just two minutes. So I'll, I'll concede the rest of my time. Okay, gentlemen, that is basically More audience Q and a, we, we've got a very much engaged audience. We've got close to 200 people all agreeing that this is a very highly entertaining and thought provoking and edifying debate. So you guys uh, gave us a debate to remember. So allow me to restart the timer and also remind everybody that we do have five minute concluding statements. So this is a good opportunity to wrap up thoughts, wrap up points, address anything we feel may have been left hanging. And so therefore to the audience, if you got a question for Robert, question for Chris, please, you got about 10 minutes to send those in and we'll have some fun interacting with those. Chris, you're in the affirmative. Let's give you the first five minutes for a concluding statement and I will start the timer on your first word. Go ahead. Great. Uh, as always, Donnie, thanks again for doing these. And Robert, I do thank you for, I, I, yeah, we've had some, some spirited back and forth. I do feel like that this has been a good, uh, meaningful conversation. So what I want to point out, just a few things. Um, the James 2 argument got the vast majority. I, I guess that's not surprising, right? The James 2 argument got the vast majority of the time tonight. Uh, I just don't think that uh, that Robert successfully did two things that I thought were necessary for his position tonight. He didn't show that given the presumption that there is a faith alone, then that clearly entails there's everlasting life, that are not justified by faith alone. Uh, and then he also didn't demonstrate that if you don't uh, get the justification by works, then you're in fact not saved. There are two justifications. And I know he's frustrated that people believe that, but that's, that's what the text says in, in my view. Um, again, I know he thinks that the Romans two issue has just not been dealt with. It's not, uh, I, I, I made the argument and I think still successfully that, um, I don't think he overthrew that argument that, uh, what one, Romans one through three, what it does is it sets the necessity of there being a justification by faith. And Roberts can say, well, that that's contradictory. It's, it's, it's not contradictory. We're setting the standard for why there must be a justification by faith and Romans four. Uh, look, they, the text never says, it just never says that Paul, that, that I'm sorry, that, um, that Paul never says that David lost his justification. I know that's important to him. He makes that point frequently in debates, but it's just, it's just not true. The text just doesn't say that. Um, and then you look at my other arguments. Uh, unfortunately, we just didn't get time. And then that's unfortunate because uh, the Bible explicitly makes justification dependent only on only on, on, on faith. Faith is a sufficient condition. We saw that in John 6, 47. Faith is a sufficient condition. We saw it in Romans 3, 22. 
faith is a sufficient condition. And again, this, unfortunately, the entire night just went dropped. It, 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 and in debate, if you don't address something, that's a concession. So what Robert has conceded, even if in his closing statement, he's like, no, no, I don't. we didn't address it tonight. And so from a, just from a, a, Robert interrupted me earlier, from a logical debate perspective, we've conceded the fact that justification is by, it's a sufficient condition is for that is, is faith. So there's nothing else that's necessary. That is justification by faith alone. And he did ask about Roman, about Galatians 3, but he never challenged the claim that sanctification isn't isn't by by faith alone. He, he said oddly that the Romans 2 is in a totally different context. I mean, sorry, that Galatians 3 is in a different context than Galatians 5. And I just kind of asked the audience, do you really think that Galatians 3 is in a, a different a different context than than Galatians 5? And I, I just I just don't really see that being being a powerful argument. Moving on to the, I'm going to go back just quickly in my last minute, say something a minute and a half about the, the line of question that I asked, I thought was really important because Robert's whole position on Galatians, on, on James 2 hinges on this justification by works being necessary. But what we see in Genesis 22, what we see there is that Abraham, God is using this to put Abraham's faith on display. He's actually justified. Like God, they, we are justifying Abraham. It's a justification before him and not a vindication. It's a justification. He is showing himself to be really righteous. And God makes that famously available. We see the same language in um, Exodus with respect to Moses. And Robert conceded all of that. So there's no basis on which to argue that the justification before, before, before men in James 2 does anything other than make you a friend of God, which is exactly what the text says. So the argument that he had to make tonight that it shows you go to hell, I just think that's fails. So on all points, uh, justification by faith alone maintains plausibility in the face of the objections. Justification is clearly by faith alone in terms of uh, that's a sufficient condition. And sanctification is by faith alone. A fortiori, so too is justification. So let me just encourage you all again. I know this is hard to believe. It really is hard to believe. We desire to be self-justified. But try it tonight. Just put, G put your faith in Jesus. Whoever believes in me has everlasting life. Believe that and then walk in it and then watch the sanctifying work he does in you it will be unlike anything you've ever seen because Jesus is unlike anything you've ever seen. And with that, I truly want to say God bless you all. And thank you so much. Thank you, Chris, for that five minute concluding statement. Allow me to restart the timer. Robert, whenever you're ready, you also have five minutes for a concluding statement and the floor is yours. Go ahead. Yeah. Let me uh, concentrate on this idea that Chris thinks you can be in sin, disown, not believe, and yet somehow you're still saved and going to heaven. You just won't receive a reward. Um, you know, there's the one passage that is used um, to try to prove that idea is First Corinthians chapter three, where Paul talks about building the building with gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, and stubble. And then in verse uh, 16, he says, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is sacred and you are that temple. So here's the consequences. God destroys you if you deliberately destroy his temple. And these are talking about people who are in the church, the Corinthians who had a lot of problems. And so he's warning them in no uncertain terms. It's not that you're going to lose a reward. You're going to be destroyed. Okay. And that's what hell is all about. So this whole idea that, you know, you can, <laughs> you can't even, you don't even have to believe, but what, because you believe once uh, you're going to have eternal life. No, that's not what the Bible teaches at all. Okay. You can go to second Corinthians chapter five, verse 10. And, uh, and you'll see the same kind of context there. He talks about, and this is, I picked this one out because people of Chris's persuasion try to say, well, this is all about rewards. It's not talking about, you know, uh, me losing my salvation. Uh, it says in verse 10 of first, uh, second Corinthians five, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive what is due him. 
for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Since then, we know what it is, it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade men. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it is also plain to your conscience. There's nothing there about reward, you know. I mean, tell me a place where bad works are not equated with sin, okay? So if that's the case, Chris is teaching that you can sin up the wazoo and it doesn't make any difference because you believe, or you believed, we must, he, he would have to clarify now. You believed once, now you don't believe and you're sinning like crazy, but you're still going to go to heaven. Wow, what a great gospel that is. No wonder they like it so much. Um, he said, uh, faith is sufficient. Is it? Well, then why would God have to have Abraham go up to the mountain and, and tell him to sacrifice his son? And as far as God knowing ahead of time, like he tried to do with Abraham's works, well, God already knows that Abraham's going to do this, so it's just put on display. Well, God already knew whether Abraham would believe or not, didn't he? So why test Abraham by making him wait till he's 100 years old to have his son? Why test him in the first place to bring out this faith if God already knows it's going to happen? Okay, so that whole thing is just shot to hell with holes in it. It has no logical validity at all. Um, and again, we have to repeat, God did not bring Abraham up to the mountain with a bunch of men there to display Abraham's works. No, but no men were there. OK, Abraham told the men to stay down at the bottom of the mountain because he had something personal with God he had to attend to. And God's the one who said him. There weren't any men there saying, oh, well, now, Abraham, you're vindicated in your justification. No, God's the one who said he was justified because God saw what Abraham did in, obe in being obedient to God. OK, so uh, as far as David is concerned, my goodness. I have never seen such a twisting of, and, and look, I can say this in a debate, Chris, it has nothing against you personally, but I have never seen a twisting of scripture as I did tonight with that passage saying that, so yeah, somehow David's involved with this sin and being justified, but not really because he's already justified. And so that passage is for other people that are in sin and then repent and they're justified. So on the one hand, he wants to join David. On the other hand, he has to separate David. But that's not what the text says. And his only complaint is, well, Paul doesn't say that David was justified. Well, then my answer is, then why mention David? Why even bring him up? If David wasn't justified from his mortal sins of a murder and adultery, it just doesn't make any sense. Okay? So nothing he said to me hangs together. It's just all, you know, well, this verse says this, and this verse says that, and if the context doesn't agree with me, I'll go find another verse that does somehow. And he makes that thing forced into his conclusion that somehow it supports what he's saying over here somewhere. You know, I just I just never know where he's coming from. Um, there's probably more I could say, but I'll hold it to that. All right. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Robert, for that five-minute concluding statement. Gentlemen, excellent debate. Uh, we've had an audience that has been very much engaged in it. And uh, Chris and Robert, I think he gave us a debate to remember. I really enjoyed it. Okay, we got audience questions, gentlemen. And what I think might be a good idea in light of some of the questions I'm looking at, why don't we format it this way? Let's say who the, we, we got a good variety of questions for the both of you. So let's say the questions for you, Robert, we'll give you whatever time you need to answer it. Then Chris will give you the opportunity to respond or rebut however you'd like to, to do that. And then Robert would get the last word. So whoever the question's for, gets the last word. And okay, here we go. Let's start with some of our super chats here. First one comes in for you, Chris. SoCal Preston, $5 super chat. Appreciate the support. John 851 teaches one needs to keep Jesus's sayings. Verily, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. This is spiritual death. What are your thoughts, Chris? Who's the question to? Uh, it looks like it, he says a uh, question for C. So I'm assuming it's you, Chris. Yeah. So verse 49, just to read into it, Jesus answered, I do not have a demon. 
So this is that whole story. But I honor my father, you dishonor me. I do not seek my own glory. There's one who seeks and judges. Most assuredly, I say to you, anyone who keeps my word shall never see death. So these the, the Pharisees have obviously rejected Jesus. They've gone so far as to call him demon-possessed. Uh, the word keeps here can have the idea of cherishing or holding on to is important. And the word here isn't commandments. It's the teaching. And the teaching is who he is. It's about his uh, uh, it, it's about his identity. So as long as you confess who Jesus is, uh, you, you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, as John 20, 31 puts it, you are you are going to be saved. Thank you, Chris. Robert, if there's anything you'd like to add or respond to, go ahead. Yeah. Um, uh, in the Greek, this is a subjunctive uh, uh, statement, and a subjunctive never gives a result. It's an aeon subjunctive that never gives a result. So in other words, um, the question is whether you are going to keep his word. Okay. And if you keep his word, that's the word aeon, then you will never see death. So here is an occasion where... Jesus might recognize someone's belief and then says, um, if you don't keep that, my word, my in, in your belief, okay, obviously then you're never, you will, you will see death. That's the corollary to this Aeon subjunctive case. So I don't, I, I think this does a lot of damage to Chris's uh, whole understanding. Because it gives an if, which means it can go either way. You can either keep the belief or not keep the belief. Thank you, Robert. This question was for you, Chris. So go ahead. You get the last word. I would just really quick make a logical point that I think Robert is a little mis making a mistake on. There's a fallacy here he's getting at. So I'm not going too much detail. If the claim is if A, then B, what we can do is we can, if A, then B, A, therefore B. So if I keep Jesus' word, I'll never taste death. I keep Jesus' word, therefore I'll never taste death. You can also say, uh, if not be the nay. If I keep Jesus' word, I won't taste death. I won't taste death, therefore I've kept Jesus' word. Those are logically, those are modus ponens, modus tollens. What you can't do is what Robert just did and say, and if you don't keep Jesus' word, therefore you're not going to see death. That's actually not allowed in logic. That's a fallacy called deny the antecedent. Um, that's a logical fallacy. Now there may be, that may be true. I'm not saying that it's not true. I'm saying that you can't just make that equation. That's, that's not the way that, that it works. All right, gentlemen, appreciate it. Now we got one for you, Robert. This one comes in from Dieter 7 $5 super chat. Appreciate the support question for Robert is James two 19 believing in one God equal salvation by faith. Or is John 6, 29, the work of God, believing on Jesus equals salvation by faith? Okay, John 6, 29 says, this is the work of God. This is the work of God, that you believe on the one he sent. All right. So a lot of people take that out of context and conclude that um, a work is faith. No. Okay. What Jesus is doing there in the context is, because they're saying, what, what can we do to do the works of God? And they don't even believe in Jesus, okay, in John 6. They all walked away from him when he fed them. And so he said, look, he's just using a play on words here. This is the work of God. Believe him, okay? That's the first thing you have to do. So don't talk about what works do we have to do if you don't even believe in God. That's the context of the passage. Now, James 2.19, um, let me just read that since he didn't quote it. Hold on, sorry. James 2.19 says, Thou believest that, that, that there is one God, that thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. So um, what he's saying there, look, is faith is a mental... Um, Mental acceding to a fact. In other words, if there is a fact and the fact is that God exists and you accede to that and you say, yes, God exists. OK, you are believing that without seeing God. That's the that's the thing there. You you believe it because and, you, and it's a mental process that you that you think in your brain. And that is what we call belief. OK. So that's James's point here. 
you can't say, well, I believe in God and therefore I'm going to be saved. Because how do we know you believe in God? You say you do. Okay. But then we look at your works and we don't see any anything to be remarkable but we see you actually sinning which is the first part of james chapter two they're sinning by telling these people you go sit over here because you're not as worthy as i am that's a sin okay so you can say you believe all you want but that doesn't save you okay it's going to take a lot more than that and just because you believe doesn't mean the works are automatically going to come out of you like a conveyor belt. Once you press the button, the conveyor belt issues all these works. That's not how it's going to come. It's going to take a lot of hard work, just like Abraham had to go through by bringing his son up to the mountain. That was hard. Okay? That's what God is going to require of you. So, those are my answers. Thank you, Robert. Chris, go ahead. Sure. Um, Robert covered a lot of it. I'll agree with him that uh, John 6, 29, that is a, um, that's not a work. Faith is not a work. That is a, uh, it, it's a kind of bit of an irony usage. The work, you can see Jesus air quoting it. The work you have to do <laughs> is, is to believe. And then sets that context up. I'd encourage you to read that chapter because I keep quoting it. John 6, 47. He goes on and um, talks about the, the, well, who am I believing in? The one that I'm the bread of heaven and therefore the believing in me is everlasting life. So that that's the whole context of that. Believing is enough to be saved. As far as 219, believing in one God, I I, I take that, oh, Robert, is, I take that to be the, a reference to the Shema. You believe the Lord is one, you do good. So I take that as a reference to Orthodox Judaism. You're an Orthodox Jew. That Orthodox, he's not going to save you. And Robert's right about this. From the judgment that's predicted in verse 13, precisely because of the many sins you're committing, such as to the sin of partiality. I think, um, I think, I don't know this. I strongly have long thought that uh, he has Isaiah chapter one, verses 10 through 20 in the back of his mind as he writes this kind of stuff. So um, I don't think I have anything to add beyond that. It's not hard though. I wish it's, it's not hard. It breaks my heart to hear that. It's just faith. It's not hard. Okay, Thank I you, Chris. Yeah, Robert, you get the last word. Go ahead. Okay. Um, Chris, you just said, that verse 19 speaks about the Jews and their belief in one God. And you say, and you said that they weren't saved. Okay. So that means that the people James is writing to here, there's a possibility that they're not saved either. And yet they're in the church. Do you believe at least that much? Just because you asked me, I didn't say that the, the tomb 19, they weren't saved. I'm talking about salvation from a temporal judgment in verse 13. I'm not talking about salvation from hell. Oh, of course. Okay. All right. So do you believe that the people that are in James chapter two are saved or not saved? They're called brethren. And so I tend to think that most of them are saved. I can't make a claim on every individual person who's reading the letter. Okay. And so you believe that those that are saved in that church won't lose their salvation, correct? If, if they're saved, they're not going to lose their salvation. And so why does Paul... We're doing cross uh, round two. <laughs> well, hold on. This is very important. Why does James then go into this whole thing about Abraham and Rahab and, and them doing their works if all these people are saved and they can never lose their salvation? So that we can be a, have a mature and complete faith lacking in nothing, that we can be friends of God so that in chapter five, our prayers can be answered so that in chapter three and four, that we can have the wisdom from above and not the wisdom from below, because it's a beautiful thing, Robert, to be a wise, mature, complete Christian. Yeah. And that, so that mere orthodoxy is not going to get you that. Oh, I agree with that. But that means all the other warning passages that James gives in James chapter one to chapter five have nothing to do with me losing my salvation. So I really have nothing Correct. to worry about as far as you're There's concerned. There's nothing about losing your salvation in this book. Yeah. The great warnings are not about losing your salvation. They're yeah. about okay. making a useless, okay. fruitless wisdom from below life. The next question. Okay, gentlemen. Appreciate the banter. Another one from SoCal Preston. He's coming at you tonight, Chris, it seems. So SoCal Preston, $10 super chat. Appreciate it. Here we go. Question for Chris. First Maccabees 252 says, was not Abraham found faithful in temptation and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. James 221 says justified instead of imputed for righteousness. Is Maccabees wrong? 
I, I'd like to honor the question because it's a super chat, Donnie. And I, I don't want to dismiss the fact that he offered that he made a ten dollar donation to the ministry to to put this out there. Robert may have something more helpful to say. I I I'm mean, to be really honest. I don't as a good Protestant. I'm not an expert on on Maccabees. Is it so? If you're saying is he wrong? Maybe uh, I've not looked at that passage in its context. I feel no need to defend. Maccabees as scripture. I'm maybe he's just wrong. Maybe he's right. And there's something in context. Robert, maybe this supports your argument. What is your take on second on first Maccabees 252? I genuinely have never read it and it I don't consider it binding. So what is your take on that? I do you know that passage as a Catholic? Uh, I don't I, I don't uh, yeah, I have it right here in front of me. It says, Was not Abraham found faithful when tested, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness? Okay, so um, I'm going to attack this in a different way, however, and I want to talk about this word imputed. Um, and this is where uh, Protestants go off on their uh, understanding of salvation. And because the word imputed there is the Greek word logizomai. And the... the um, proposition by the protestants is and i don't know if chris holds this but i'm just going to mention it anyway because this is the major belief that they have that that when something is imputed um it's it's not something real it's something mm -hmm. that is credited to your account you're imputed with it but it's not that you yourself possess it okay now, if you look up the word logizomai, which is from where they get this translation imputed, it never means, and it's used 26 times in the New Testament, it never means that you are credited with something, that you are given something that's just somebody else's, or anything like that at all. Every time it's used in the New Testament, it means that the one who's being viewed possesses the very thing that was described. And this is where Catholic understanding of justification comes in. That's why we say he's infused with grace, which changes his soul. In other words, he's not imputed. He's infused in the sense that his whole soul is now different because he has received the grace of God. Okay. Mm -hmm. Directly opposite of what, uh, Martin Luther and John Calvin said, and uh, as I said, it can be proven by doing a word study on logizomai. Okay, so what I would like to know is what the Greek is behind First Maccabees two fifty two, which I can do right now if you guys are interested. Um, if you're not, if you want I to, go bet on. it's logizomai. Sal Silkow just said he quoted it from the King James, and that tends to be a pretty consistent word for word. So I bet my bottom dollar it's logizomai. Um, he quoted from the King James, uh, from, um, the, uh, Sept the Septuagint King James. Well, I mean, from the, 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 yeah, the Apocrypha, some King James had the yeah, Apocrypha. The Apocrypha, Apocrypha in them. Okay. Well, they, all they would do is use reckon. They would use the same word that they used in, in Romans yeah. 4, 4. So, um, I mean, if, why, why don't you get the next question, Donnie, and I'll go look for this as you're, as you're doing that. So we don't waste time. Okay. All right, next question here comes in from Evan Roges. $10 super chat. Appreciate it. It's for you, Chris. Mm -hmm. What church fathers taught the concept of sola fide as the Reformation understood it within the first 1,400 years of the church? So there actually are um, some people who did. Uh, they were, of course, regarded as heretical by the church, but for and some of them weren't actually. Uh, one of the earlier ones I know, about fourth century, just before Augustine, Marius Gaius Victorinus, Victorinus, I think, his commentary on Galatians. He explicitly uses sola fide, that language. He uses it in his commentary on Galatians about a half dozen times. So if you can read Latin, um, then. I, I'm not a Latin expert, but I had to, to learn it for my work on Aquinas, and so I could work my way through his commentary. So you can find that. Uh, if you come to the Free Grace um, discussion board on Facebook, we have some people there who have some good um, – th this isn't – patristics isn't my specific area, but I have read a, a good half dozen sources of people who you know talk about they believe that you can – 
that you can believe and then not worry about it. And of course they're written off as heretical, but the point is people did in fact believe that. So it's not, uh, there are other reasons that I'm not too worried about the historical argument, but you ask the specific question. There's an implied argument but to answer the question you're asking. Um, there at least was a, there at least was one, if not a couple. Okay. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, Robert, any thoughts on that one? Um, yeah, let me just say that logizomai is the Greek word in 1 Maccabees 2.52, just for those mm. who are interested. And um, can I just say real quick, Robert, and I don't want to interrupt your time. I just want to say I don't, I'm whatever the crap chat says, I, I'm not a fan of the legal fiction argument of logizomai either. I don't, I don't hold, I'm with you in that I don't hold to a legal fiction for righteousness. Well, that's good to hear, Chris. Um, okay, so as far as this question here, um, I have in my book, Not by Faith Alone, for those who are interested, uh, Appendix 7, um, which is uh, the use of faith alone in patristic and medieval literature. So you can read all about that history there if you're interested in purchasing the book. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 10, 11, 12, <laughs> See, I didn't know what all this long, sorry. Um, like 15 pages on that issue. So um, we can take the next question if you want. Oh, do, do you want me to answer this directly? No, it probably would be better. Um, so if yeah, like there, were, there were a couple of fathers that used that language, Solophita, because everything was new. There was no controversy from the Reformation to set a context for this. That people were wondering, gee, I wonder if it's okay to use this phrase or not. What do we mean by that? So by the time, right. and this is a long time, by the Council of Trent, you know, in 1563, the, it became an issue because this was the first time that the church really got down to the nuts and bolts of justification. And and from there, the canon canons, there are four canons at the Council of Trent that say. You can't use the phrase faith alone because it's confusing, yeah. number one. And number two, it's just not doctrinal. So but let me real quick, just to strengthen, Rob, I do just want to strengthen your case a little bit because, again, I'm not a church history expert. I know I know a few things. Um, I, I tend to look pretty askance at claims that we can try to find proto-Reformation, proto-free grace guys in the early church, and there are reasons for that. I would recommend people R.F. Torrance's dissertation on the doctrine of grace and the apostolic fathers, he holds the claim, and I think he's right for other reasons we don't have time. It's a whole other debate that the for a lot of reasons that the church rejected what we would call faith alone in the New Testament times itself. And so you can use that as a historical argument against faith alone, which is an interesting conversation. Um, yeah. But I, I, yeah, I think right. we need to be careful about making a historical argument either way. It's an interesting conversation, though. Yeah, what would happen is a father would, you might use the phrase faith alone, but then in another mm -hmm. talk, he talks about works justifying you. But they don't right. get those passages. They only get the ones. Exactly. That they, the ones that they want to have faith alone, right? Yeah. Well, it looks like uh, Evan here has a follow-up for you, Chris, based on your answer. So why don't we put it up on the screen here? $10 Super Chat. Appreciate it. And it's good to see how engaged everybody is in tonight's debate. So he's asking you, since you mm -hmm. listed Victor Innes, Victor Innes, however you say that, as one mm -hmm. that taught sola fide, what Protestant slash Catholic scholarship that you've read demonstrates your assertions that this is taught? Well, again, the particular reference to Sol to Victorinus, I just read his direct commentary, and I have read the ancient Nicene Fathers. I got interested in church history, and I read through the Fathers. It was actually Sean Wilson, if you're out in the crowd, you had done a review on church fathers, and so I was reading through. And again, this comes up in in um, that that these historical arguments come up as a historical curiosity. And again, I, I tend to think sometimes there are too much of them. Uh, and again, I would recommend to you R.F. Torrance's dissertation on the subject. I think that dissertation is a, is a good, solid work. Thank you, Chris. Robert, any, any thoughts on that at all? Yeah, I'm trying to see if I have uh, Victor Rinus's statement here in this, uh, because I have all the fathers that use that phrase in bold, and I don't have his name here, so yeah, it's in it's in his commentary on Galatians, and I've only okay I feel like I found it once in English, but it's mostly in in Latin. Okay, we can move on. 
Okay, we got another one here from SoCal, but this time it's for you, Robert. So SoCal Preston, $5 super chat. And question for Robert. Cast me not away from thy presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Psalm 51, 11. Can the Holy Spirit leave me? And can I pray this verse today since David did? Um, if you commit mortal sin like David did, adultery and murder, yeah, the Holy Spirit leaves you. That's why you're unjustified. And that's why you need to be re-justified. And that's why you need to repent of those sins and get your justification back. Okay? So if you're in mortal sin, yeah, you've lost the Spirit of God. That's why uh, 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 David is praying here. He's repenting. Take not thy spirit from me. And God answered him. Because he repented, the Holy Spirit didn't leave him. But that didn't mean that David wasn't going to get punished, as even Chris recognized. Uh, that David lost his child, and his life was never the same after yeah, that. Very true. He was chased by his, his sons all over the place, and he was not a happy camper, believe me. Yep. Okay, thank you. Uh, Chris, anything you wanted to add to that, or should we move on to that? I uh, keep it very, very, very brief. Uh, there is, I know the standard dispensational answer. And I, I, I don't, I tend not to like the idea that David is making an ontological claim here. Uh, I, I tend to hold the view that election under service. And I think David had a job he was called to do. And anytime God calls you to do a job, he enables you to do it. And so I think there's a very real possibility in the Christian life of God calling you to something. And then in your sin, you can frustrate what God is doing in your life. And so there is a sense in which that in which that can happen. Now you don't lose the indwelling of the spirit. I, I don't think. But Paul's not. He's not. He's not a Pauline dispensationalist in the sense of the word. He's talking about an ontological fact. This is about enablement for ministry. Thank you, Chris. Robert, it was directed at you. So if you wanted a, a final word well, on that, I would just say uh, Chris has just given more evidence that we are miles apart on this because he still believes that David can't lose his salvation. And I believe he does. If he commits mortal sin, he's lost his salvation. And that is the crux of this whole debate, you see. Mm -hmm. uh, if we can iron that out somehow, some way in the future, uh, it, it, we would probably wouldn't even have to debate. But that is the crux of this issue. All right. Very good. Chris, next one's for you. $20 super chat. Appreciate it. For Chris. Can you summarize free grace theology for us in brief on this topic and have Roberts and Jenis respond? Yeah, sure. Um, so in, in honor of Robert promoting his book, I don't have a book on this yet. Uh, I do have a 10 minute video on the YouTube channel. Go over there and check it out called What is Free Grace Theology? Uh, the super short summarization is it's a soteriological claim. There are broader claims you can make on it, but it's a soteriological claim that takes faith alone in Christ alone is logically consistent. It really is the case that simply by putting your faith in Jesus Christ as the son of God, believing that he has given you everlasting life, that alone guarantees everlasting life that cannot be lost. Uh, there are rewards that are available to continue if you, for walking in, walking in faith and being faithful. Uh, those sorts of things are all true, but the actual uh, belief, salvation in the eschatological sense of the word really is completely and totally. Whoever believes in me has right now present tense everlasting life. It's that simple. No gimmicks. All right. I appreciate it, Chris. Robert, any, any thoughts or anything you'd like to respond to there? Uh, yeah. I think one of the main passages he pointed out tonight was John 6, 47. You know, where Jesus says, I say to you, the one believing has life eternal. Um, you know, it's a present tense verb. And as far as Greek is concerned, that does not mean you're going to be believing in the future. What what free grace does with this passage is it says it puts something into the context that's not there. And what they put in there is that the believing once gives you eternal life. The passage doesn't say that. The passage says the one believing has eternal life. So if that's if we take that at face value, and in the future you lose your believing, well then apparently if like one equals one, um, that means you don't have eternal life anymore. Okay? The passage says the one believing has eternal life. 
which means the one not believing does not have eternal life. I mean, if we can't do that with Scripture logically and figure out what the opposite would be, then we really have no basis on, on interpreting this because anybody could come in here and say anything he wants about this passage. That means, well, why do you have to believe once? And if I stop believing, I still have eternal life. Well, how do you know that? I mean, you're you're basically doing the opposite of what you claim I'm doing. You're trying to figure out what the passage means, and you inject something in there that the passage doesn't say. Okay? So that's just not fair. So the whole free grace thing is built on a faulty premise. And, it, and once somebody knocks that down, it's going to come down like a house of cards. Thank you, Robert. Chris, it was for you. So if you wanted a, a final word there, go ahead. Uh, the faulty premise is whoever believes in me has everlasting life. So if Jesus is faulty, then I'll agree. I'll admit that it falls down. We, it's, it's not a matter of being subjective in interpretation. The text says exactly what it says. If you believe you have everlasting life, and I'm sorry that you can't logically, you just can't deny the antecedent and think that, that that's not, that's not, it doesn't mean therefore that you can say anything it wants. What it means is what it says. And this really is probably another point to make about free grace theology. We have an extremely conservative hermeneutic. We believe what the text says and then the direct implications that come out of it. Uh, and we don't just let ourselves say, well, but this sounds nice too. That That's not what the text says. Listen, y'all, we are playing with the word of God and you cannot just, you can't put words in God's mouth. God doesn't like it. Read Deuteronomy. God doesn't like it when we do that. Uh, Chris, just to, out of curiosity, is there any passage you can point to that says, um, even if you stop believing, you still have eternal life? We went over that in Cross Rewind, the video. I gave you about a four or five passages. I would repeat those four. Just give me one. we could do more. You saw the second Timothy passage? That's the one. Second. Sure. That's one. That's one of about four. If we're what faithless, he remains faithful. Yeah, he remains faithful, but it doesn't say that he's not going to disown you. Sure, because he cannot deny himself. So he's going to yeah, keep the promise he that he made faithful. to us. That doesn't mean that you remain faithful, right? Right. And he, he disowns you from that, from the fact that you didn't remain disowns faithful. Disowns you from rewarding. Again, I'm going to encourage the audience oh, to go back. We, we've, been, we've been over that. Well, don't you think that's rather convenient, Chris, that you can go and put it rewards in the context when, they re when the context doesn't say anything about rewards? To the charge of convenience, I will say I don't think it's convenient when you trace an author's line of thought. If he makes the argument and you state his argument, that's not convenient. That's just believing authors are rational agents who are making arguments on purpose that make sense. I, I didn't understand a word you said. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> is, is it okay for me to say I could listen to you guys debate all day? <laughs> yes. Go ahead. Next question. <laughs> Very I'm not offended. Listen, you said early <laughs> I, on. I think you I guys mesh I'm not well. offended. This is fun. <laughs> you guys mesh well, your personalities and your in your debate approach. So I okay. like you a lot, Robert, just for what it's worth. You are I really enjoy you and I enjoy this. <laughs> you may not like me, but I enjoy this quite a bit. <laughs> I don't like you, Chris. <laughs> I, I like that. <laughs> I like okay. that you guys okay. bring the heat. I would appreciate that. <laughs> So, uh, Robert, we got one here for you. Anthony Aquino, appreciate the support. So he's wondering, uh, King Solomon, he, he died in apostasy, 1 Kings 11. Is the question, uh, is he saved or not? Who's the question to? Uh, I think it's. it looks like it's for you, Robert. Oh, okay. Well, I've often used 1 Kings 11 to show that a guy who believed ended up in apostasy because of all the concubines and the wives he had a thousand of them. I mean, it's kind of hard for that guy not to be influenced by his, by his wives. There's so many of them. Uh, and that's basically, he went to serve foreign gods, the foreign gods of his wives. Okay. And first Kings 11 is quite clear that this guy ended up in apostasy. Now here's the problem. However, when you get to, to uh, first Chronicles and it talks about Solomon, it has a different view of Solomon. Okay, it tries to make him look better than he really was. And this is the problem between Kings and Chronicles. Kings always gives the negative side and Chronicles gives the positive side. So, And the truth is somewhere in between. Okay, because just like, you know, I could give a biography of Chris after I've seen him tonight and make it real negative 
if I had to write for some author or something, you know, who said, make, make Chris look real bad. So I could, I could write something. It would be easy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no wonder, because you believe you can live in sin and still go to heaven. No, I'm just, let me take over. <laughs> Fighting words. <laughs> <laughs> See, I can make Chris look real bad in one paragraph. And then totally, if somebody says, hey, puff Chris up, I can make him look good in the next article I wrote, you know, depending on what I'm looking at and how, what points I want to make in my perspective. So uh, that's the problem with Solomon. And, that, and that's why sometimes we're unsure of his final destination. Appreciate it, Robert. Yeah. Chris, what are your thoughts on the matter? Uh, I would say that M.A. in the comments at 943 by my time, nah, the truth is in both. I, I don't think it's actually the case that their truth is in the middle. I think that Kings is telling a specific story about, about Solomon, and it's really true. And that... Um, and that Chronicles is telling a story about Solomon. It's really true. It's 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 a dangerous game that we play. People do this with the Gospels all the time. They try to mesh the Gospels together and get the real story of Jesus. That's not the way to do it because what happens is you miss what Matthew says and what Mark says, etc. Same thing is going on here. And so Kings doesn't hide from Solomon's mistakes or David's, and there's a reason for that. And Chronicles, on the other end, written as it was of the exile, has a different purpose, which has to do with the temple and worship of God and things like that. So there's a purpose that is presented that way. Neither one are false. It's just a particular aspect of life they're emphasizing for their particular theological messages. If he went to, I don't, I don't have, Solomon rather clearly believed in God. And so I don't think he died in apostasy, even if he did, he saved. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Robert, anything you want to add in terms of a final word there? No. I'm done. All right. Gentlemen, I think we got one last question here. Let me just, Double check just so I make sure I honor these. Oh, it looks like, okay. So one, maybe two. Let's see. SoCal Preston. I don't think we asked this one. It's for you, Chris. $5 Super Chat. Appreciate the support. You said Jesus kept the whole law. Did he offer sacrifices too? God knew man would break the law, so he set up sacrifices for atonement. Numbers 28, 22. It's for you, Chris. What are your thoughts? Well, the sacrifices are for if a person sins. Um, and so if Jesus, if there's a non-sin sacrifice, Jesus would have done that. But Jesus doesn't commit sin. So there's no reason for him to offer any sacrifices other than, of course, his own self on the cross. Thank you, Chris. Anything you'd like to add at all, Robert? Yeah. Um, Jesus went to, he was circumcised as a child on the eighth day. His mother brought, what, two turtle doves uh, as a sacrifice for that required by the law. Uh, Jesus went to Jerusalem on the three big feast days, you know, uh, Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. Okay. And at those times, sacrifices were being performed by the priests and all the people partook. So in that sense, Jesus partook of the sacrifice. There were other sacrifices that were mandated for people who sinned. So if you sinned, okay, here's the sacrifice you do in Leviticus or Numbers. They were all outlined as to exactly what they had to do. But as Chris said, since Jesus didn't sin, then there was no um, voluntary sacrifice that he had to perform. All he would take part in is the general sacrifices of a Jew on those three feast days. Thank you, Robert. Chris, anything you'd like to say in terms of a final word? Nope. He said it perfectly. I always do, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> I believe you. Just kidding you, buddy. Just kidding you. That's <laughs> okay. All right. Guys, this is a very rewatchable debate. Better than any movie, in my opinion. So. Excellent. <laughs> Centurion. So we got two more, one for Robert, one for you, Chris, and we're going to we're going to wrap things up. I really appreciate the time you've both uh, offered for the, tonight's debate. So Centurion, he's got a question for you, Robert, and he's yeah. asking, why in Psalm 51 does David ask God to restore the joy of his salvation and not restore his salvation? Well, see, we, what you've done here is you've, you've um, defined the joy of his salvation as him continuing in his salvation. He just wants his joy restored. 
You don't know that. Okay. I could say the same thing, restore the joy of my salvation and, and be asking God to give me my salvation back because I know once I do, then I have my joy. You can think about it that way also. Okay. So it's a matter of interpretation here, what you're doing. Thank you, Robert. Appreciate it. Chris, go ahead. Just in terms of, I think Robert's point is fair. There are plausible interpretations. I think if you believe you can lose your salvation, you can plausibly read the joy of my salvation is I'm happy to get it back. Um, I wouldn't personally take that view, but I don't think that that's something that's just, it, it's not like the fact that he says joy of doesn't necessarily mean that he didn't lose salvation as such. That's consistent with you can't lose your salvation clearly, but it's not in, it doesn't entail it. Thank you, Chris. Robert, did you want a final word? Nope. That's good. All right. And then we got your question right here, Chris. It's another follow-up here from Evan earlier, $10 super chat. He says, last question for Chris. Have you watched Perry Robertson's an Eastern Orthodox response to Anthony Rogers showing what Marius Victorinus was not teaching the concept of sola fide on YouTube. You're getting pretty deep in the literature. No, I've not read it. Although I would be interested. My um, When I worked at Mercy as a hospital chaplain, my boss of six years was, a, was an Orthodox priest. And so I got to know the Orthodox pretty well. Um, wonderful um, theological conversations we had late into the night. So I would be more than happy to to watch that video and uh, see what he has to say. And I also have a lot of respect for Anthony. So I'm, I'm curious if Anthony has a response to it as well. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Robert, any, anything you wanted to add? No, I, I think that question has been answered, um, you know, about Victorinus. So yeah, it's over. We we just got an after credits bonus question. So to the audience, we're going to have to wrap it up, right? It's for you, Robert. So you yeah. must have said something that triggered a question. Let's see. Uh, and really, we only got through a fraction of the questions. We've got unlimited questions, you know, to keep us busy till the rapture. So uh, we'll wrap it up here. <laughs> <laughs> Five dollars. That's another thing I want to debate. <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> Evolution, the rapture. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be busy setting you up for debates, Robert. So th this questioner, he's wondering, do you recognize that there is evolution, speaking of evolution, in Protestantism, and we need to listen to new arguments, not just reformed ideas? Yeah, but it just so happens that the once saved, always saved idea is not only the reformers, it's probably 90% of Protestantism today. The 70 million evangelicals that we have going to fundamentalist churches today all believe that, that once you have your salvation, you can't lose it. So um, it's not just, you know, in the crucible of the 15, 16 under, this is evident today. And that's basically one of the main parts of this debate we're having now. Okay, appreciate it, Chris. Any, anything you wanted to add? Just a one small nuance, um, and I'm sure our audience here knows this. There is a difference in what the majority of people believe in the Reformed camp, say Presbyterians, is that their final perseverance of the saints, which even Baptists hold to this. It's in their Bap Southern Baptist Statement of Faith. Uh, there is a difference in the final perseverance of the saints and eternal security is once saved, always saved. I would deny rather strongly that final perseverance of the saints is the same thing as once saved, always saved. I think that in practice, Catholics, Arminians, and Reformed, I'm going to offend a lot of people here. I think in practice, Catholics, Arminians, Reformed all believe identical things as it relates to that particular doctrine. It's only uh, eternal security, once saved, always saved people who are different on that particular issue. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Robert, final word? No. Nope. All right, all. gentlemen. I appreciate this. I had a lot of fun, very engaging, entertaining, edifying, the three E's. And so why don't we get some quick final words, final thoughts. Chris, let's start with you again. I appreciate the time, not only for the debate, but for the prep that goes into these debates, gentlemen. So Chris, any final words, final thoughts? I I, I, I'm sorry you don't like me, Robert. I, I really do appreciate the conversation. I, and I, like I, I, I think you're playing. <laughs> I, I, what I appreciate about the debate we've had tonight, and I want to say this sincerely, Robert, thank you. You, you are an accomplished man. You have paid your dues. You don't have to be here. So what I would, I think happened tonight above all is that we're, we're certainly not going to agree, but I really think what happened is we really did 
um, lay out some differences that people can see. If they disagree with me, they'll know why. If they disagree with you, they'll know why. So I think that actually advances the conversation in a meaningful way. So I don't shy back from 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 being blunt and neither do you. And so I think that helps a ton lay positions out. So I really appreciate you in a lot of ways. Yeah, Thank and you. thanks for calling me on my uh, attempt at comedy there because if you didn't, <laughs> I probably would have tried it again you know, <laughs> and made a jerk out of myself. So very well. Um, <laughs> anyway, so like when I when I uh, when Donnie contacts me to debate, I said, Donnie, you know, I really it doesn't matter to me what we debate. And I said, we could actually debate some new stuff. And this is the first justification debate I've had probably in about 20 years because wow. he had me in for the geocentrism stuff and a lot of other stuff, evolution, creation. And uh, I said, I, it doesn't matter to me. Just get me a gentleman to debate. Okay. Because <laughs> I've had some doozies over the years. Yeah. I can attest to that. You know, where it just becomes a shouting contest and yeah. the, the guy, who was that one guy, uh, Donnie? <laughs> <laughs> you geocentrism. Off. Yeah, it was a yeah. geocentrism. What was one. his name? Grayson. Grayson. <laughs> my gosh. I hope I never see that guy in my life again. Anyway, um, if I get a guy like that to debate, I, I will walk off. Okay. And I think I did it with Grayson. But thank you for being a gentleman. You are a gentleman, and I love thank that. You. And God be with you, sir. And um, you as well. Thank you very okay. much. That's truly what I strive for. Thank you. Robert. Okay, great. Good. All right. We're done. Right. done. Yeah. Gr great debate. Great final words. What I like about the both of you, why I like having you both on is you're both good sports. You both bring the heat. You're adamant. You're confident, but you shake hands at the end of the day. So that's what I like yeah. to see. Robert, Chris, yeah. appreciate the debate to the audience. Thank you so much for tuning in. And okay. Standing for truth right. is out. God bless all. Okay. Thank you, Donnie.